This begins with a boy named Haru-kun, who seems to be leaving his current city for another, but his childhood friend, Mii-chan, with tears running down her face, doesn't want him to go. Haru-kun quickly holds her hands to comfort and calm her, and promises to come to get her when he grows up, and then marry her. That seems to be the only way they can always be together, side by side. He added that even if he dies, he'll protect her and she agrees. He boards a bus, which eventually gets involved in a traffic accident, and he dies. In the Kingdom of Beltram, year 991 of the Holy, in early spring, a boy named Rio wakes up from a long sleep and finds himself in a room that he doesn't know he got there. The memories of the past life of a boy whose name is Haruto Amakawa keep popping into his head, but he can't figure out what the memories are. Then, some guys come in with a big tightened sack, and they see Rio alive. One of the guys thought he'd be dead by then because he was reeling from a fever the previous day. The guys talk about their business while they enjoy their meal. Rio's tummy grumbles, and then one of them calls on Rio and he answers joyfully thinking he'd be called to eat. But he says he stinks and tells him to go and wash himself. As he leaves the room, he gets some fruits from a tree. While he eats, the memory of who is Haruto Amakawa and how he died pops up again. But he makes up his mind that he doesn't, and he remains Ryo, who lives in a filthy slum so that he can avenge his mother. He remembers his last moment with his mother, where he asked her why they all had black hair, and she said it was because she and her husband came from a far-off place. Along the line, she promised to take him to his grandparents at Yagumo when he gets bigger, but an unknown killer killed her. Ryo cries a little, cleans his face, and takes his shirt to wear. Then, some women walk up to him but don't get closer because he stinks. One of them asks him if he's seen a girl with purple hair who is about the same age as him, and he says he doesn't know. One of them decides to handle the situation, so she moves close to him and feels sorry for surprising him that way. She addresses herself as Cecia, and he says his name is Rio and his parents are immigrants. Celia can tell because his hair is black. She asks her again about the girl they're looking for, but he gives the same response. She asks her if they can look for her in the slum, but he advises that it'd be better if they don't, because it's not somewhere ladies dressed in clothes as nice as hers should go. She asks what type of clothes they wear in the slum, and he says the same as common people but completely tattered. Lady Vanessa suggests that they change their clothes and come back, but Lady Christina says they should hurry. Lady Vanessa replies that they should be careful not to cause a disturbance, which is something Lady Christina doesn't want. Lady Vanessa tells Celia to look for a magic response in the vicinity, and Celia chants, Area to do the magic. Surprisingly, Celia can sense magic in Rio, and she tells the other ladies that Rio is overflowing with quite a large quantity of magic power. He has the potential necessary to use magic, but he's surprised that the strange light on him is magic. Lady Vanessa asks Celia if there are other responses, but she says the magic reactions the search caught are theirs and Rio's. The ladies don't seem to see the light on him, Rio wonders. Then, the ladies decide to check other houses for her, but Celia quickly comes back to compensate Rio with a token in return for the information. Rio opens the small pulse and sees it contains many greater silver coins. He looks around, keeps the token, and runs home to meet with the other guys he left home. On getting home, Rio opens the door, and a strange man with a mask on his face suddenly grabs him and attempts to stab Rio in his chest, but lucky for him, the token is there to block the attempts. The token and Rio fall to the ground, and the strange man closes the door and moves toward Rio. He looks around and finds everyone dead, and then he asks who the strange man is. The strange man attempts to slash him, and then a lady like an angel appears ahead of Ryo and calls Haruto. She promises to teach her about Odd and how to use his magic power. She holds Ryo's cheek and tells him to sharpen his senses, then the light begins to come from his body and fades away into the air. As the man almost hits him, he dodges it and punches him in the tummy. The strange man chants, enchant physical ability, and he makes more moves to kill him. But Ryo eventually throws the strange man to the ground, and his mask falls off. To Ryo's surprise, the strange man happens to be the same guy's boss lying dead on the floor. Then he hears someone's voice in the sack from earlier, so he quickly opens it, and it happens to be the small girl the other women are looking for. The small girl begs him to save him, and takes him to the castle where her father will reward him. The small looks at her side, and sees a dead man lying, and she faints. Rios carries the girl to her castle, then she meets the women on the way. Lady Christina thinks he lied to them, so she walks up to him and slaps him. She collects her sister, Flora, from him, and Vanessa calls on Rowana and Celia to help Flora because she seems to be unconscious but unharmed. Lady Christina asks Rio what he was plotting, kidnapping his sister, but he says she asked him to. Lady Vanessa asks Rio to explain in detail to them, but he says Flora asks him to. Lady Christina interrupts him and holds onto Rio's shirt. Rio holds and squeezes her hands and tells her to listen to the end. Lady Vanessa draws out her sword to warn Rio to let go of Christina's hands 
and Christina to stop provoking Rio. They let go of each other, but Lady Christina says she'll have him charged with Les Majeste. Lady Vanessa insists that they hear what happened from him, and Lady Christina tells her to hurry and restrain him. Lady Vanessa says Rio will have to accompany them to the castle, but he doesn't. Lady Vanessa tells him it's an order. He says all he did was rescue her when she woke up. Lady Vanessa tells him he'll have to tell them what he knows. Then he feels like trying to protest there would only be a waste of time, so he accepts to follow them, but only to talk. Lady Vanessa says he'd be released if innocent. Some royals come to check the house where the incident happened, and one of the guards calls on Sir Alfred that they find a man still breathing. The guards bring out the man, and he happens to be the strange man with a mask. An unknown man in the crowd sees him and breaks a material, which causes the strange man to die instantly. The unknown man confirms he's dead, and leaves the area. At the castle, Rio's hand is being hung and he's being tortured by Charles Arbor, the vice captain of the Knights of the Royal Guard. Rio asks why he's being tortured because he only agreed to come with the ladies to the castle to talk. Charles says Rio will have to tell him all he knows about the kidnapping of the second princess. Charles says he will take it easy with him if he cooperates with the inquiry and will release him immediately. He has to admit to his complicity in the kidnapping of the second princess, but Rio says he didn't do anything like that. Charles gets mad at him and hits Rio badly with a wood. Charles asks him the second time, but he still has the same answer. Princess Flora finally wakes up to see Lady Vanessa and Celia, and they give her water to drink. She explains what happened to them, but Vanessa tells her that an investigation is going on to determine if Rio's testimony's content is true or not. Princess Flora tells Vanessa to summon him to her place, but Vanessa says it'd be challenging and it would require the consent of His Majesty. Then, Princess Flora tells her to hurry and make the necessary arrangements because she can't allow him to meet with any inconvenience. Vanessa and Celia both leave to deliver the message. Charles is still hitting and keeps asking the same question, but nothing has changed and Rio on the other hand is tired. One of the guards tells Charles that Rio will die. He keeps on torturing Princess Flora to be abducted. He added that things won't end well for the guards if they don't restore their reputation. While he talks, Vanessa and Celia come to the scene and see that Rio has been brutally tortured. Charles claims to be conducting a lawful interview. Celia says the guards should let Rio down. Charles says it's highly likely that Rio is involved in the kidnapping of Princess Flora, but Vanessa tells him that Princess Flora says she owes Rio her life. Charles is glad to hear that Princess Flora is alive since it's the most important thing, so he orders his guards to let Rio down. Celia tries to be helpful, but Rio tells her not to touch him, and he falls on the ground. Celia feels sorry, and says she'll heal her right away. Charles tells his boys to let them leave the scene, and Vanessa looks at him while he leaves. Rio wakes up and finds himself in a room, and asks where he is, and Celia replies that he's in the royal palace. She asks him if he's alright, and doesn't feel any pain. He's surprised to see that he can't have any form of scratch on his body. Celia feels sorry because they made him go through something terrible. Rio asks her if she was the one who healed him, and she says yes. She added that she's learning magic at the Beltram Royal Academy too, and says her full name is Celia Clare. She asks him if he remembers her and he says, then thanks her. Rio asks what is going to him now, and Celia says it seems like Rio is to be granted an audience with his majesty the king, that he wants to express his gratitude to Rio in person. Rio begs her to teach him the manners needed for an audience because he can't see the king without knowing any protocol. Celia agrees to teach him. They both shake hands and look forward to working with each other. At the king's palace, Rio is welcomed into the king's palace by the king and the royals. In return for what he has done, the king says he will have him attend the Royal Academy's primary school as a scholarship student. Professor Celia tells Rio that they haven't evaluated his academic abilities, so he asks him if he can read and write, but Roy says no, he never studied writing. In that case, Professor Celia tells him that she will tutor him, and tells him to her research lab after school. Professor Celia is trying to draw his attention to the fact that many of the children at the academy are from royal or titled families, so he says it's all good that he knows his place. Professor Celia then says he shouldn't hesitate to come to her if he has any problems. Professor Celia opens the classroom door and welcomes Rio to the Beltram Royal Academy. Professor Celia announces that a transfer student, Rio, will be joining the class starting today. She says everyone should be nice to him. The class began to murmur, saying this and that. Professor Celia tells him to introduce himself, and he introduces himself as Rio. He says that through the kindness bestowed upon him by His Majesty the King, he has been allowed to attend this place of learning. He says he knows he's lacking in many ways, 
but he hopes that the other students will look favorably upon him. One of the students says Ryo seems to be able to speak as well as a servant, at least, and the whole class laughs at him. Professor Celia commends him and tells him to go take a seat, and then she begins the lecture for the day. She tells them to bring out their notebooks and copy down the numerical formula. Then, Professor Celia tells them to try to solve the problem she wrote on the board on their own. Professor Celia walks up to Ryo and tells him not to push himself so hard today. The other students hear this and laugh. One says Ryo can't read, but Professor Celia tells them all to focus on their work. After class, Ryo finally finds Professor Celia's research lab, and he hears her voice from outside, so he knocks on the door. Professor Celia opens the door and yells at him why he didn't read the sign, but he quickly says he's sorry that he can't read. Professor Celia realizes that it's Ryo. He says he's come to inquire about his private tutoring, but she claims to have been waiting when Ryo simply knows that she's forgotten. She allows him into her office, but it's all messy. She says it's just a bit messy at the moment, but she's much more organized. While she attempts to clear some space, Ryo sees her bookshelf and tells her that she looks so young, and she's tempted to say she's just 12. She says, frankly, she should be attending primary school, but she skipped grades and ended up graduating from high school. She gives her some calculations to solve, and he eventually finishes in no time. Professor Celia is surprised that he quickly solves them, but he says it's only simple multiplication and division. Professor Celia confesses that the only one in his class who can do it is Princess Christina. Then, Rio remembers that he was a university student, so it makes sense. Professor Celia asks him where he learned arithmetic, and he says from his mother who died. Professor Celia feels sorry about that, and she decides to make them some tea. He drinks the tea, and he likes it. Then Professor Celia asks him what his first day of academy life looks like. She asks if he has any problem, and he says nothing in particular. She says again that if there's anything, he should inform her. Then he says one thing, which is that she should recommend some children's books. He says he wants to learn letters, and she agrees to pick some books for her in the library. It's a training day, and everyone has their partner to fight with, but only Ryo has himself to train with. So the master tells him to come and strike him in any way he sees fit. Now all other students look at this. The master tells him to attack. He remembers that his master used to tell him the same thing when he wanted to fight. With the way he fights with the master, he sees seems to be good at swordsmanship, but the other students still say bad words about him regardless. At the end of the fight, the master tells him that he has the makings of a knight, but Ryo says he has no interest in joining the knights, and thanks him for his kind words. After class, Ryo is seen studying by Professor Celia, and he commends him. He says end-of-term exams are coming up soon, so he needs to study hard. Professor Celia says he's just being enrolled in the academy, so he shouldn't worry much about his grades. He says he won't, but he will give it everything he has. On the exam day, they all had their examination questions, and Professor Celia told everyone to do their best. After the exam, he comes out of the class to the playground where he sees a lot of students playing, and then a memory of a lady named Mie-chan pops up. The students notice and begin to say a lot about him. He leaves their sight to go to his room. Then he remembers a lady named Ayase Miharu, Amakawa Haruto's childhood friend. But the two of them were separated when Haruto's parents divorced. Then, he saw Mie-chan again in high school, but she never came back to school. It was as though she'd erased herself from his sight. But after these memories, Ryo wants to believe that Amakawa Haruto is dead, and that he's not Amakawa Haruto anymore. He is now Ryo, and that's why he will live through this. He will be tenacious and strong. The final examination result is out, and Ryo's name comes out alongside Princess Christina which the students by surprise. Ryo joins them at the board, then Alfonso walks up to him and asks him the impropriety he has perpetrated, but he doesn't know what the student is talking about. Alfonso points at the board and says, a commoner like Ryo can never stand with Princess Christina at the top of the class. Ryo says he only took the exam, but Alfonso believes Ryo must have used some kind of tricks. Princess Christina stops the argument when it's getting heated, and says the jealousy of a gentleman is unsightly. Alfonso screams that he can't let this pass unchallenged, and he will have this injustice. Then, Princess Christina asks him if he has any concrete evidence, and now he's silent. She says, unsubstantiated allegations only serve to duly the dignity of the academy. Professor Celia comes in and says the achievement is the result of Rio's hard work, and she can attest to it. Alfonso says he'll never accept this, then he leaves with his crew. Rio wants to thank Princess Christina, and she quickly interrupts him and says, it was nothing, and she didn't intervene for his sake. Princess Christina tells him he won't beat her next time and she lives. At Professor Celia's research lab, Professor Celia congratulates Rio on placing first in the end of term exams, and she thanks her. She says she's a little worried when she thinks that even more students may look for ways to find fault with him. Well, he says he's used to it already. Professor Celia says that the bullying by nobles only shows poor character on their part. Then, Rio asks if anything similar happened to her, since she says she excelled. She confesses 
guesses that there was this and that from those of a higher social standing and their followers, but she ignored it all. She had friends back then, but Ryo says he will be fine because he has her. She only feels like Ryo is making fun of her, probably treating her like a child, but Ryo says he's older than him. Ryo thinks of her as a friend, and she says she doesn't mind. Ryo tells her to say it again, and she says the same thing and says Ryo can figure it out from the mood. In that case, Ryo says that if he ever gets into trouble, Professor Celia should advise him as his teacher and as his friend, and she agrees. She added that when he's about to cry from all the bullying, she'll take him to her bosom. Ryo says she's small, so in terms of positioning, she seems perfect for clinging to. She hits the table and says she's not small and still growing. They talk about their heights, and they laugh at the end. At the training ground, the master informs the students that an exhibition tournament between the Knights of the Realm will be held again this year, and representatives for the primary school division have been selected from the class. Then, the master begins to call the names of the selected ones. One, sixth year, Alfonso Rodan, two, fifth year, Steward Huguenot, and three, Rio. The students murmur again, most especially Alfono. He says he won't accept this because he wonders why someone so lowly is chosen to participate in a knightly tournament. He says it's a disgrace. Besides, Rio can't even use magic. The master says it has been decided, and no objection will be entertained. Back to Professor Celia's research lab, she says she hears that Rio will be participating in the tournament, and he says yes. Professor Celia says if Rio performs well in the tournament, the Knights may scout him even before he graduates. She's finding it hard to put up a book on the bookshelf, and Rio helps with it as he says that he has no intention of becoming a knight. She notices that Rio has gotten taller, and says she suppose it has been five years already, but Rio tells her that she's just as small as ever. She screams at him not to say small, but she's still growing. Rio says she said that five years ago, and then she reminds her that the tea will get cold. Rio makes them tea this time, she likes it. She says the scent is completely different when Rio makes the tea. Rio says he follows the instructions he read in books. Professor Celia asks him what he'll be doing after he graduates, since he says he doesn't want to be a knight. He says he'd go on a journey because there's somewhere he'd like to go. Professor Celia asks if he wants to leave the country, and he says the country is difficult for him to live in. Professor Celia asks him, why don't work in the academy because, without him around, all sorts of things will go wrong. She explains with him making tea and tidying up his lab. She says Rio always chides her when she gets too caught up in her research. Rio says he's grateful for her consideration, but sooner or later, she will enter into marriage talks. She asks why he'd say that, and he replies that it wouldn't be good to have some unknown commoner in her research lab. She says she has no intention of getting married for a long time, and Rio says she can do whatever she likes. Rio commends her beauty, and she doesn't know what to say. She quickly asks him a question. She asks him where he wants to go, and he says, his parents' homeland, the Yagumo region. She quickly says, Yagumo is a place at the edge of the wilderness. Rio's carried away thinking about the promise his mother made him to take him to Yagumo when Professor Celia calls his name. Rio answers that, it's only a plan. It's that time for the tournament between the glorious knights of the realm and the students of the Royal Academy to begin. Alfred Emerly announces himself as the referee, and the crowd applauds him. Sir Alfred is the first challenger from Beltrum Royal Academy Primary School in Rio. As he steps out onto the stage, Alfonso tells him not to put on a pathetic performance out there because he'll lower people's opinions of him as well. Rio tells him that he will do his best not to fight an unsightly match. Alfonso says nobody is expecting anything from you either way. Professor Celia hails Rio's name and tells him to keep it together. Rio tells Sir Alfred that he's ready to fight. Then Sir Alfred says the first challenger from the Knights of the Royal guard is Charles Arbor, who happens to be one who tortured Rio at the royal palace. Charles says he knew Rio would be enrolled in the academy, but he never imagined that the dirty little brat from back then would be his opponent. Rio, on the other hand, says he owes Charles a debt for his care back then, and he feels sorry that he couldn't have been of more help. Sir Alfred says cease their chatter, then challengers at ready. Sir Alfred sees Rio in that stance, and Charles feels like Rio is mocking him for not bringing a shield like he did. Sir Alfred begins the match. Rio keeps dodging and blocking Charles while Charles is on the stage fighting his ass out just to get revenge because he was punished with a demotion five years ago because of Rio. At the end of the fight, Rio has his sword pointed at Charles's chest with Charles unarmed. Sir Alfred announces Rio as the winner. Charles tries to beg for a second, but a loss is a loss, says Sir Alfred. Sir Alfred tells Charles that if he's a member of the Honorable Knights of the Royal Guards, he will graciously accept his defeat and take his leave. Charles admits his loss, and Rio thanks him for the match. The master and Professor Celia hail and praise Rio. The crowd applauds him as he steps out of the stage. On the night of the same day, Charles is seen angry, 
and saying a lot about the fight he had with Ryo, and explains how he and Ryo first met five years ago to a man who seems to be the unknown man when the kidnapping happened. The next day, Professor Celia is seen hoping that Ryo will show up because she needs to celebrate his win with him, and he finally sees him, but he seems to be headed somewhere else. Ryo meets with a woman and gives him something to read about the fight he had the previous day, and she says he was so very dashing. The woman says this and runs off, but Ryo can't stop her. Professor Celia sees everything that happens from behind a tree where she hides, so she leaves as soon as the woman runs off. Professor Celia is checking through the students' plans for after graduation, but she can't find Ryo's the only one who didn't write anything. Then, she remembers Ryo telling her the other time in her lab, that he'd like to go to his parents' homeland, the Yagumo region. In the class, Professor Celia will be taking the class on magic use, where she says magic uses formulae designed to control magical power and pour ode through them. This craft meddles with matters of the world. She says the fifth and sixth year will use lighting to deepen their understanding of controlling magical power. Then, Alfonso signifies and says anyone except Rio in the room should be able to use low-level magic, and Stuart says the lecture is intended for those with poor magic control, and the class laughs. Professor Celia sighs and tells both of them to try using lighting, then try it. Professor Celia says at that level, she can't say they've mastered it yet. She added that being able to cast a covenant formula depends on a person's affinity. It's not the same as being skillful in magical control. Professor Celia closes and opens her eyes, and all the opened windows of the classroom close. Close. She then says, even without the use of magic, with the existence of artifacts, some can use multiple magical techniques simultaneously. She chants, Decte, Magician, then Lighting. And the source shows at every space below the ceiling, which gives the classroom full brightness. She tells them that one person can control that many lights at once. She bursts the lighting into very small pieces. Rio smiles at her, and realizes some lighting in his hands. He says in his head, that it's true that he can't cast magical covenant formulae as they can, but by imitating the flow of magical power, for some reason, he's able to reproduce magical techniques. She looks up, and Professor Celia tells him to let them begin their lecture on magical control. The class has ended, and some students are moving outside. Then Stuart commends Professor Celia and tells her he's moved, and she thanks him. As Rio is stepping out of the classroom, Stuart turns to him calls him a commoner, and says Rio seems to have been seducing the female students of late. Rio asks him what he meant by that, and Stuart says Rio's win in the tournament is simply a fluke. All Rio says is he understands completely. Stuart tells Rio to stop trying to push himself forward. Professor Celia stops Stuart and tells him that nobility should not lay criticism without definite evidence. But Stuart faces the professor and says the brat is trying to flirt with her. Professor Celia says nothing like that sort has ever happened. He turns to Rio and tells him if he tries anything foolish during the outdoor practicum. The House of Duke Huguenot will not stay silent. Rio bows to show some respect, then leaves. Princess Flora, who experiences what happened, feels bad for Rio, for it's a false accusation. In the area where the students have outdoor practicum, the students are going to be tested on how well they've learned military exercises at the academy. Flora says she's nervous, but Rowanna tells her not to since it's a team competition, and all the most dangerous monsters have been culled. Alfonso is the one who will tell the students the details of the practicum from the notice. He says to withdraw from a battle zone. Their units will travel the shortest course through the mountain forest and aim for the goal. And he says the operation lasts until sunset. He added that good results will have a tremendous impact on all of their grades. Then, he calls on his team to let them reach the goal by afternoon. Rowana asks if it won't be impossible as the place is a wooden, mountainous area. And of course, it will take twice as long to travel anywhere. Alfonso tells her not to worry because he's got a special course in mind. Stuart explains the soldiers who serve in his home region just happen to be quite knowledgeable about the geography of the area. He tells them that he had them tell him about all the animals' paths that can be used as shortcuts, and then he passes it on to their upperclassmen. Rowana says it feels like cheating, so she doesn't like it. Alfonso says that information controls everything in war is no exaggeration, so they're practically guaranteed a good result here. Alfonso asks Princess Christina for his opinion, and she says she'll leave it to him as he is the commander of the unit. Stuart turns to Rio and tells him to consider himself fortunate. He's just a hindrance who can't even use magic, but they've prepared a job that even you can do. He shows Rio everyone's luggage and tells him to carry it and follow them. He agrees to carry it. Princess Flora walks up to him to ask if she could help with Little, but he says it's fine that he will do it. They head out with Rio being left at the back and Flora is worried about it being maltreated always. All of a sudden, monsters show up ahead of them, but Alfonso tells the students not to worry much as the monsters 
happen to be goblins. Alfonso says the three in the vanguard should use artifacts to boost their physical abilities. As he charges, three of the students chant, enchant physical ability, and they knock all the goblins. Alfonso says they are nothing much but they need more formidable monsters. Alfonso calls on Rio not to just stand there in a daze. Rio apologizes, and they continue their journey. Amongst all, Rio in particular is being tailored by the unknown men along the forest. The unknown is contemplating if he should test Rio a little and see what his true capabilities are. The students find their way out of the forest and feel like they're close to their goal until they find a cliff and they start to wonder if the information is wrong. Christina asks their commander what to do, and all of a sudden a spear is thrown from inside the bush which almost hits Rowana. The enemies reveal themselves and they happen to be orcs. Alfonso calls the vanguards to raise the shield and block the spears. Rio blocks the spear coming his way, but Stuart who's holding a shield can't defend well, and the spear slashes his leg. While he screams his leg, he goes near a student who is fighting but the student pushes him away. The push is too much which makes Stuart have contact with Flora and she falls off the cliff. Rio quickly flies after her, activates his power to charge Flora's, and then pushes her forward upward while he falls off the cliff. Flora gets up after she lands back at the top to look for Rio but can't find him. With the student's magic, they conquer the group of orcs. Rio thinks it might look suspicious to the other students that he falls off a cliff with no injury. He's sure it's not magic or magical techniques, but he can't know what the power is, not even the lady that appeared to him while he was fighting the mask man. Then, he hears the students' voices up the cliff blaming Stuart for pushing Flora off the cliff. Stuart finds his way to convince some of the students to believe that it's all Rio's fault that Princess Flora falls off the cliff in the first instance. The commander says it'd be better if they find their way out of the forest, then Flora asks if they're just going to leave Rio, but Alfonso says he's got what he deserves. He hears everything and feels like his plan to graduate from school won't stand, so he leaves. Flora tells the other students that she'll help Rio, even if it means only she will help him. They hear a thick voice with the ground shaking with every step of the monster shaking. The monster reveals itself, and a fierce monster. The monster roars at them, and the commander is scared of the monster. Princess Christina chants Thunderball to attempt a strike on the monster, but the monster thwarts the attack. Alfonso suggests they use Ice Lance and calls the Vanguard to increase their physical abilities. The ladies chant Ice Lance while the guards chant Enchant Physical Ability. The fierce monster dodges the ice attack and attacks the Vanguard men. Alfonso screams that they retreat. While others run, Flora has gone behind to heal some of the wounded students. The monster gets to her and attempts to hurt her, but Rio comes to the scene and cuts off one of the monster's hands. Rio tells Flora to take the wounded student and get away from the area. Rio fights the monster with every inch of him till he gets a great strike to slash the monster's neck and it vanishes. Rio leaves the area before students notice that he's the one who killed the fierce monster. The unknown man sees how he fights the monster and finds it more entertaining than ever. He notices Rio's black hair. He could tell that he was the offspring of people who drifted here from the Yagumo region, and that's why he'd able to use the spirit arts. He laughs and he leaves. Professor Celia is walking through a path complaining about why a lot of tasks are always assigned to her. Then she hears the judge having a conversation with Sir Alfred and Stuart. They're trying to push the situation and make Rio the center of it despite him missing. Professor Celia wonders what could have happened. While she's in her research lab worried, Rio knocks and enters her lab, and he apologizes for causing such a commotion. At first glance, she runs into him and hugs him. She touches his body and asks if he's alright, but Rio claims that it's tickling him. He explains everything to her, and she also informs her that they're laying a false charge on him. Professor Celia tells him that he hasn't done anything, but Rio says it's the people in power who decide what's wrong or not. Even if he appeals with the truth, no one would acknowledge it, and that's because he's not of the nobility. Professor Celia wishes he could do something about it. Rio thanks her for all she's done for him and says he's glad to be able to meet her. He says she's the one person he wants to say goodbye to. He tells her that he's going to the Yagumo region. Professor Celia confesses that she wanted to see him graduate, but Rio says he'd send her letters along the way, but he'd be using Haruto as alias. They hope to see each other again, and she hugs him and wishes him the best until he returns. Sir Alfred throws assassination targets clothing to a captive girl to smell so she can always remember the smell of her target. He describes the target to be 12 years old, a male. His name is Rio, and his hair is black. He tells the girl to find Rio and kill him no matter what. The girl agrees to carry out the assassination. After three days of forest journey from Beltran, the royal capital, Rio finds a neighboring kingdom and arrives in Amon Market Town in the kingdom of Galark. He writes a letter. At the entrance of the market, he sees a wanted poster, and there is a wanted poster circulating in the royal capital so he can't procure the items he needs for his journey, but he's relieved that he's on the wanted poster here at Galark Kingdom. In that case, Professor Celia shouldn't be worried. Despite the first time entering Amande, 
Rio sees it as a bustling, lively town. Foodstuffs are plentiful, and it looks like he'll be able to acquire preserved foods quickly, which is a relief. As he walks around the town, the assassin girl is tailing him, and at the same time, Rio feels like he's a little too on edge, so he quickly turns back to look, but finds nothing. As Rio wanders around, he hears a man advertising his soup-style pasta, so he moves toward the man to hear him out. Being new to the town, the man describes how the town came up with soup-style pasta through Lady Lizalot, who governs Amande. As he thinks about it as the first time he'd be seeing it, his stomach sounds, then he requests one bowl. He takes his first bite, and he likes it. He has the quick flashback of Haruto having soup-style pasta, so he asks himself if the Lizalotte person also came from the same town as Haruto, but then, he quickly gets his mind off it as it doesn't seem like anything can be done about it. After the meal, he continues his journey to Yagumo because it was a promise he made to his mother. He finds a building the Lee Salati person describes for him, the Rika Merchant Guild where he'd find a menju shop. He sees a woman and her child having menju meat buns, and a lady who seems menju outside the building. Well, he enters the building and looks around the building till a guild attendant tells him to refrain from wearing a sword within the store. She says they can help him look after it while he checks for things. As Ryo pulls off his hoodie, to unsheath the sword and give it to her, she sees his black hair, and she's kind of surprised. She collects the swords and thanks him for his cooperation. She introduces herself as Lata, and she will be helping him today in the store. She helps him package all of his stuff and serves him some black tea, and he drinks it. She asks him if he's accustomed to drinking black tea, and he says among his acquaintances is a lady who loves black tea and he learned a lot from drinking with her. Lada asks him if he recognizes the tea leaves and he says the unique aroma and slight astringency. Then he says their tea is good, and he likes the glassware too. She says their merchant guild's motto is to provide a perfect environment for negotiations to have the best possible dealings with their customers. Then she asks if they should undertake the delivery of a letter for him, and he gladly says yes. Rio writes a letter again to the professor, saying she's completed his purchases and is about to set out. Once he leaves the Stral region, he won't be able to send more letters, but still not to worry. No news of him is proof that he's doing well. Rio thanks Lotta and others for their service, and he leaves. Cosette tells Lady Lisa Lotta that Rio is a bit mysterious, but she answers that she's Lotta right now. As Rio continues his journey through the forest, he sees a girl, and he tries to check up on her, but she turns out to be the assassin girl. She injects Rio with poison, but he manages to push her steps away from him. He looks at the girl's face and ears, and he identifies her as an East person. The girl brings out a knife and says she'll kill him. The poison is affecting him, so he quickly neutralizes the poison and becomes stable. He tells the girl that he can't let her kill him. Then, the fight begins with both of them dodging each other's attempts. Rio throws some small arrows at her, but she dodges them, runs up a tree, and chants, enchant physical ability. Rio sees that she doesn't seem to have already enhanced her physical abilities with magic, but he wonders how fast she will be after enhancing. Rio flies to reach, and she throws small weapons at him, but he blocks them with his sword. The girls attack in all ways, but Rio gets the knife from her first, as it's her focus, and then grabs her and hits her back on the ground. Her eyes clear, and she begins to scream saying kinds of stuff like, she doesn't want to die, calling mama, mom, and the like. Rio sees that the screaming isn't going to stop anytime soon. He has no choice but to put his hand on her face till she sleeps. Rio has her hands and legs tied so she won't get to do much when we wake up. He sees the collar of submission in her neck and remembers that he's seen a spell of magic in a book. Then, he tries to imitate it in the collar of submission in her neck and it falls off her neck. She seemed to be involved in the accident but woke up with a different identity, where she was named Latifa and forced to accept someone as her esteemed older brother. Her former identity's name is Endo Suzune. Rio wakes her up from sleep and she's trying to let go of herself but her hands and legs are bound. Rio warns her not to get violent like she did earlier if she doesn't want to die. She asks to be sure he's not going to kill him if she doesn't fight, and Rio says it depends on her. Rio asks her question but she doesn't reply, then he shows her the broken collar. Then, she realizes that it's the collar on her neck. Rio tells her that the collar was the reason she was obeying orders but she won't be stricken with pain, nor have problems answering his questions anymore. She cries out loud. Rio asks her, the person who gave her orders, and looks around to see if anyone is around, but he tells her that it's just the two of them there. She says she doesn't know the name of her master because she's never been told before. Rio asks for the name of their house, but she quickly remembers the name of her esteemed older brother, which is Stuart. He asks her if he is a beast person like her, but she says her older brother is human, and he's the one who trained her. From that, Rio can tell that it's Stuart from the Academy, and Duke Huguenot decided to make him disappear. Thinking about it that way, everything seems consistent. Rio asks her if there are others besides her trying to kill him, and she says she doesn't think so. Then he asks her if she still intends to kill her, and she says she won't kill him. In that case, 
Ryo says he's left all her equipment with the robe. He cut off the ropes in her hands, meaning that she was free to run away. He also mentions that she doesn't need to go back to her master since the collar that controlled her is gone. He pities and tells her to leave the kingdom and head to the east, a vast area known as the wilderness. He says there's somewhere in the land where beast people like her and other demi-humans live together. Ryo sets to be on his way and reminds her that he won't show any mercy the next time she attacks him. She keeps following Ryo, and Ryo is tempted to ask if she has some kind of business with him. Then she says she wants to go to the east with him. Ryo tells her that he didn't release her from her enslavement because he wanted to rescue her, but it's only that not killing her was more convenient for him. She says she doesn't know what to do. Ryo tells her that he's human, just like the people who enslaved her. Ryo says she can't trust her because she might attack him again. Then she tells him to return the collar to her neck because she hates being alone like this. Ryo tells her to do what she wants and get rid of the collar. Ryo introduces himself and asks her for her name, and she says, Latifa. Ryo prepares them food in the forest, and she seems to have never eaten something like that since she's being held captive, so she cries while she eats. But Ryo calms her. Ryo and Latifa are about to reach the wilderness, and it's getting late, so Ryo suggests that they make camp for themselves. Professor Celia is happy to receive Ryo's last letter, but not receiving more news will make her feel a little lonely. She hopes that wherever Ryo is on his journey, he's safe. At night, Ryo makes them spaghetti, and Latifa seems to like it so much. Ryo asks her if she's eaten pasta before, and she says she used to eat it. Well, Ryo tells her that she can eat as much as possible. Ryo reasons, if Latifa is calling pasta spaghetti, does it mean she comes from Haruto's side? While they're sleeping at night, Latifa cries out from sleep that it wakes Ryo. She says she wants to go home. Ryo moves closer and pets her. She says she misses her mom, dad, and Oni-san. She says she wants to go to Tokyo. Latifa wakes up the next morning and sees Ryo's black hair, and she gets up and screams. She could tell he looked like the guy she saw before the accident. She moves closer and says, Onisan, and he somehow answers and wakes up. Ryo says good morning and asks her if she slept well. She suddenly hits her head against the wall, and Ryo asks her if she's good. She says, yes, Oni, Ryo. She says she wanted to say, Oni-chan. Then, she asks if she could be calling Ryo Oni-chan, and he agrees. She says she wants omelets with cheese in them for breakfast. Just that moment, Ryo notices a big tree not too far from them, but Latifa can't see it. Ryo wonders if the tree is being blocked from people's awareness through magic. Ryo wants to go into the deep forest to find out what the tree is about, but Latita seems scared, and she can see a faint scent, so they decide to rest for the day. At night, Ryo is outside near the wood fire, while Latifa is inside having scary dreams. Ryo notices and uses his magic to heal her. All of a sudden, the light outside goes off and Ryo steps outside to check what it is. Then he sees a wolf, which in no time transforms into some demi-humans, reflecting so much light into Ryo's eyes. One of the demi-humans named Uzuma hits Ryo. Ryo then uses spirit art to detect the demi-humans in the area. Sara tells Uzuma to retreat due to the spirit art. Ryo asks if they're demi-humans because he'd like to talk. Uzuma tells Sara that humans are a dishonorable lot, and Sara says she knows but they need to learn what Ryo's aims are. Uzuma says they should prepare for the worst-case scenario. Uzuma tells Orphea and Alma to investigate inside the camp. Sara steps forward to tell Ryo that they've accepted his proposition, but he shouldn't refer to them as demi-humans. Ryo thanks her for her ready consent and introduces himself as Ryo. Then he apologizes for any form of offense. Orphea and Alma call on Sara. They find a child of the beast people in the camp, and it seems like Ryo used spirit arts to make her sleep. Uzuma moves closer to Ryo and hits him with her spear weapon. Sara tells her that she hasn't given her order, and Uzuma says he's a marauder who has kidnapped one of their kin. Ryo uses his spirit art to heal himself, and Uzuma still attempts to attack him. Ryo brings out his sword to block the attempts. Uzuma says they have ascertained that he has one of their kin in the camp. She added that as they have questions about the situation, they will have him refrain. He insists that it's a misunderstanding because he is hoping that they will take her under their protection. Uzuma never stops attacking as she says who'd trust a human much less a kidnapper's word. Alma holds Ryo's leg to the ground with a magic, and Uzuma electrocutes him to sleep. Ryo wakes from a dream calling Michan repeatedly, and Alma and Orphea ask if he's alright, and then he opens his eyes. Latifa comes in and runs into Ryo, with tears on her face. Ryo asks her why she is crying, and she says she thought he was gone. She tells Ryo not to leave her. Then she notices that Ryo's hand is tied up, so she asks them who did it, but none of them answers. Sarah and Uzuma enter the room along with another elder of their kind. The elder apologizes to him and says she'd like to hear about the young girl. Latifa asks if they're the ones that did this to Ryo. Uzuma bows and offers her sincerest apologies. The other three also apologize to him. 
Ryo says the most important thing is if the misunderstanding has been resolved. The Elder says Uzuma will take full responsibility for her thoughtless actions, as well as the other three. Ryo tells everyone to raise their heads. The Elder calls on Orphea to release the shackles from his hands. The Elder tells Ryo that the Elders will gather the next day to give him a formal apology, but for tonight, all they can offer is a humble room. Ryo and Latifa kindly accept her kind offer. The Elder says she has many preparations that must be made, then she excuses herself. They all exit the room for Rio and Latifa. The next morning, the elder is seen leading Rio to the elder gathering, when Rio sees a tree and asks the elder, what tree is it? The elder tells him that it's the world tree, in which the great Dryas, a spirit of mighty trees, resides. Rio knows that heading to the tree is what brought him this far. The elder says a high-level illusion magic barrier is erected around the tree. Without considering knowledge of the spirit arts, one should not be able to see through it. Rio says what he uses is the spirit arts, then basically self-educated. They manage to get to the elder's gathering, and they offer him a seat. The elders introduce themselves likewise to Rio. Rio thanks them for their courtesy and pleads with them. Sildora, the elder's head, says considering their misunderstanding caused such great trouble from their kin, and that Rio freed one of their kin who had been taken into slavery, they offer him their apologies and their most heartfelt thanks. Rio is honored by their words of apology and gratitude. Then he says that the fault lies also with him for so thoughtlessly setting foot in their domain. He tells them to raise their head. Sildora says they are hoping we may be able to do something as a sign of their gratitude, and Rio asks them what they mean. Ursula says as they are of different peoples, it is difficult for them to determine what would show their gratitude to him. Rio bows, and asks them if they would take Latifa into their care. Ursula says that is their wish, plus they should be the ones bowing their heads and asking of him. Rio says Latifa has grown attached to her, so Ursula seems to understand what Rio's saying, and she asks Rio if he can live with them in the village for a while for Latifa's sake. She added that all the elders in the gathering agreed, so they'd like him to stay. Dominic says Rio is an even better man than Ursula made him out to be. Dominic confesses that he likes him. Sildora says they intend to take every measure to make sure living in their village poses no inconvenience. He also tells Rio not to hesitate to tell them if he discovers anything he wants in the meantime. Dominic says he could even marry any of their girls. Ursula tells Dominic not to get so carried away. Rio says while he lives in the village, then the spirit arts and any knowledge that seems useful for daily life, if he could be taught such things. Ursula says that wouldn't be a problem at all. Sildora says they'll need to find an accomplished teacher. A voice says, well, it seems that conversation has come to a close. The voice asks if it would be alright to move on to her business, and then a ladylike angel appears behind Rio. The elders are familiar with her, so they tell Rio that the personage before him is the spirit of the world tree, Lady Dryas. Lady Dryas is pleased to meet Rio, as well as Rio too. Lady Dryas sniffs him and says, it's very weak, but she senses the presence of a spirit within him. She asks him if he has an idea what it might be. Well, she says Rio has made a covenant with it. Rio says he doesn't have any particular memory of that. Lady Dryas finds it strange. She says if Rio makes a covenant with a spirit, things like an inability to use magic often occur, which can be difficult for a human. Lady Dryas asks him if it would be alright if she looked into it a little, and he says he'd appreciate that. Lady Dryas holds his chin and tells him to excuse the intrusion. Lady Dryas says he has an incredible amount of OD hidden inside him, and it looks beautiful. She asks if Rio is a human. Rio asks her if she finds something, and she says more than something. It's like there's a person-shaped spirit sleeping inside him. With his reaction, Lady Dryas Dryas could tell that he didn't know how rare a person-shaped spirit is. Lady Dryas explains to him that spirits that can take the shape of a person, like her, are of the second highest class or greater. Lady Dryas says the spirits of the highest class, once called the Six Great Spirits, all went missing in the Divine Demon War over a thousand years ago. She says the spirit sleeping within Rio may be one of those high-class spirits. Rio asked if it would cause some kind of problem. Lady Dryas says no, but for the children of the village, it might be a matter of great importance. She says she's only a spirit of the second highest class, and they've gone and deified her. Rio asks the elders what that means, and Sildora says they must once again rethink how they treat him. Ursula says it means they would discuss whether it would be better to treat you as a saint. Rio doesn't know what it is, but Dominic tells him not to worry about the details, but to just think of it going to extra special treatment while he's in their village. Rio smiles and agrees to do it. Lady Dryas takes Rio to the place where he will be staying, and Latifa runs to hug him the instant she sees him. They welcome him home, 
and Latifa says the house is amazing. It has an open-air bath, kitchen, and a beautiful view. They serve them oriza grains, and Rio asks about it. Sarah says it's a foodstuff that originated in the Yagumo region. Latifa gladly ate the rice and fell asleep after eating. Sarah asks Rio which of the rooms he'd like them to sleep in, but Rio doesn't seem to understand what she's talking about. Sarah says the three ladies are to live in the house and look after both of them. Latifa seems surprised too. Then Lady Dryas asks if she doesn't want them to but she doesn't know what to decide. Lady Ursula comes to the scene to apologize to Rio for not informing him about the ladies that'd be living with them. Rio asks if it wouldn't cause problems for them living with humans like him. Lady Ursula tells him that talk of him and Latifa has already spread among the villagers. She says if the higher-ups in the village approach him as they might have some kind of abscess, that would be far worse. She whispers into his ear that it's for Latifa's sake. She says someone besides him who can be her guardian, her friend. She needs someone who will stay by her side. Rio says he's grateful for what it means to Latifa, as long as they aren't imposing on Miss Sarah and the others. They smiled and thanked Rio, and Rio did the same. Rio says he'd be grateful if all the ladies could stop using Sir with him. Then, they ask if Master Rio is okay. Rio seems to like that. He's welcomed by everyone in the village, and he's now being treated like one of them. He participates in their day-to-day -day activities and learns how to control magic, etc. It's time for their annual festival, which is the rite for the Grand Spirit Festival. All villagers, including Rio and Latifa, are gathered at the shrine to do the right. They pray and hope that blessing and divine protection shall forever accompany them, the people of the spirits, in the path they travel. Then, Lady Dyrus appears to them and they all cheer. The unknown man and a guy are seen descending at the front of a cave, and the unknown man is headed into a cave. According to the unknown man, the cave master will be out looking for food around this time and won't be returning for a while, so he tells his guard not to worry. The unknown man named Master Rice comes out of the tunnel with a very big egg. He gives it to the guy and tells him to let them leave the area. While they climb on the big bird that brought them, the guy asks if the parent of the egg won't get angry and come to take back the egg, but Master Rice only says the distance between here and the Stral region is considerable. Master Rice laughs as they exit the scene. At the Grand Spirit Festival, Rio is welcomed as their sworn friend, and Latifa as a resident of their village, with a kiss of blessing from Lady Dryas. The villagers are happy to witness it and all feast at the end of the ceremony. During the feast night, Every member of the village is having fun to the fullest, but Latifa, Sarah, and Orphea are all around Rio, telling him how much they want to be friendlier to him. Although, seems like they are getting tipsy and Rio, on the other hand, is not social, he hopes he does better after he hears from those ladies. To exchange cups of friendship, the ladies head to bring more drinks. Lady Ursula tells Rio that Latifa seems to be having fun, and Rio says she has become an integral part of our village. Rio stands on his feet and tells Lady Ursula that he's thinking of telling Latifa about him going soon. Lady Ursula says she is sure going to miss him, and she feels like it's a little too soon, but perhaps the right time. It's late in the night, and Master Rice and the guy decide to rest in a forest, and they'll depart for Stral early tomorrow morning. So he ties an eagle with a rope against a tree. Then, Master Rice says he's going to investigate the area a little, and begs the guy to look after the griffin. Then, he shows him a red-like stuff, which he calls a type of artifact. He tells him that it gives protection in the event the worst happens. He added that if he swallows it, he will be able to tell where he is. The guy collects it and swallows it. Master Rice tells him that if anything happens, he shouldn't worry about him, but he should the griffin to escape. He points in a direction and says if the guy heads in that direction, it will be easier for him to find him. As Master Rice leaves, he says again that the guy should take very good care of the egg. A few moments later, Master Rice is seen at a level in the air where he says he believes it's just about time for the birds to come after the egg and long enough, he could see them coming. Master Rice hopes his lure plays his role to his utmost. Then, he leaves. Rio tells Latifa to let them take a walk. After a short walk and still going, Latifa asks Rio what is wrong because he's yet to say something to her. Rio says sorry, and she says they should go back to the plaza as there are still lots of food and drinks left. Rio asks Latifa if she enjoys living in the village, and she says yes, it's really fun because everyone, including Rio, is here with her. Rio tells Latifa that after a little while, he's gonna leave the village, but she says no. Rio tells her that he was originally headed to the east and she quickly says that she's going with him, but Rio says he can't take her with him. Latifa asks why not, and he says he's going somewhere he's never been before, and he can't tell the dangers. Latifa says she doesn't want to be apart from him, 
ever. Latifah doesn't want to hear more excuses, so she walks out. Sarah is reporting to the elders about a reaction inside the barrier, and affirms that Lady Dryas noticed it too. Elder Sildora says it seems it isn't simply one or two. Sarah says she'll go and confirm immediately, and Lady Ursula tells her to take warriors with her. Master Rice finds his way to the cave and sees plenty of eggs, and he says it seems everyone leaves, leaving no one behind. He says their faculties of pursuit are impressive, but it seems their intelligence is somewhat lacking. Then, he takes his time acquiring the eggs in the cave. Uzuma says she's detecting suspicious and owed reactions, and Sarah asks her for the location. She says two in the spring. Ozuma says there's a human and a griffin. Sarah quickly cautions all of them not to initiate combat. They land near a bush that the guy thinks it's Master Rice, but the ladies show up instead. Sarah tells the guy to come quietly and do as they say. Uzuma asks him what he's doing at this time of day. Sarah sees the egg with him and asks him what kind of egg is, and the guy draws out a knife to scare them. He quickly cut off the rope, used to tie the eagle and took off with it. Uzuma seeks Sarah's permission to attack. Sarah says it seems it's unavoidable so they should target the griffin. Uzuma fires but the eagle dodges it all and it's headed toward their village. While he flees, the wyverns arrive to attack. Uzuma sees a flight of wyverns, and she calls the attention of Lady Sarah. Lady Sarah sees them, and she wonders why they come to a place like this. Then Orpheus says it could be the egg that the boy has. Sarah says they can't allow him to enter the village. Sarah calls on Alma and Orphea to tell them that they will all handle the black wyverns. Sarah says Uzuma and the rest of them should take the other wyverns. Alma sends someone to inform Mistress Ursula and others. After acquiring the eggs in the cave, Master Rice says the guy's role is over, and he squeezes the red-like stuff in his hand, which kills the guy and he falls off the eagle, but the wyvern follows him. Sarah tells Alma to take care of the black wyvern and Alma asks Sarah if she'd lend her her bond spirit so that she can fight alongside her Ifrita. She agrees, and does it. Latifa is walking through the forest thinking about what Rio told her, then an egg and the guy hit the ground. Latifa walks up to the guy, but he's dead. She sees the broken egg and a huge black wyvern shows right in front of her. The black wyvern sees her egg, and she roars. Rio gets back to the festival, but he notices everyone running here and there, until he finally sees Dominic, to ask him what happened. Dominic says the festival has been cancelled, because a flight of wyverns is approaching. He tells him that it seems like Sarah and others are holding them off above the forest for now, but they may soon be upon us. He immediately remembers Latifa, and he runs into the forest to get her. The black wyvern hits Latifa against a tree, and he almost burns her with fire when Alma gets there to block the fire. The black wyvern raises her leg to step on them, but Alma grabs Latifa and leaves the spot. She chants Ifrita, and a lion shows up. Alma climbs on it and tells Latifa to stay back. The lion and wolf fight the black wyvern, and Alma flies high to hit the black wyvern, but it's alert enough to thwart both the attack and Alma away. Alma hits a tree and falls on the ground. Alma says at this rate, the wyverns will reach the village. The black wyvern burns the wolf and lion. While Alma is thinking of buying some time, Latifa is already trying to distract her so that she won't get to the village. She claims to be a villager too. The black wyvern blocks Latifa's way with a tree and is about to step on her. Then, Rio hits the black wyvern, and he quickly picks Latifa and feels sorry it took him so long. They land, and Latifa says she's the one who's sorry since she ran off like that. Rio tells her that they can talk better later, and then he faces the black wyvern. He battles with the black wyvern with his bare hands. The black wyvern wants to release fire at Rio, but Rio throws magic to block the fire in her mouth, which blows off its head and dies. Sarah and others meet them there. Sarah commends Alma for having killed the black wyvern, but Alma points at Rio and says he defeated the black wyvern single-handedly. One of them says the other wyverns must have retreated, because the black wyvern was defeated. Sarah says wyverns are timid by nature. They won't challenge those they know they can't beat. She faces Master Rio and thanks him. Rio and Latifa apologize to each other for how they didn't handle the situation well. Latifa says she already knew the truth that Rio might leave one day. She says she was scared because she's only ever caused trouble for him, and she thought he might want to leave. She says she wondered if she was a hindrance to him, and Rio says she's not troublesome or a hindrance to me. He calls her his little sister. Then, he tells her why he's heading east, towards the Yagumo region. But he never tells her why. He says it's the land his late parents came from, and that's why he wants to try going there. Latifa says this is the first time Rio will ever tell her about himself. She says there is something she wants to tell Rio, and can't tell if Rio will believe it. She says she died once, and she used to be human. She was reincarnated, and became the person I am now. She says she was in a place called Japan before. Rio believes her because he's the same. He was a Japanese person just like her. Latifa asks him if those regrets appear, and he says yes, but he swore that he would be strong and survive the world. That's another reason he wants to go to Yagumo at least once. She says she'll be stronger, and she'll be here waiting for him to come home. Rio is set to leave, 
so the elders do him the honor of seeing him off. Dominic tells him to quit talking like we're strangers. He gets Rio a sword, made up of mithril, so it can absorb his spirit arts and cloak itself in them. Also, an armor, made from the hide of the black he defeated. Its defensive strength will make him think metal armor is no better than paper. Rio thanks so much. Lady Ursula gifts Rio secret medicines and wondrous elixirs from the elves. Also, from the beast peoples, foodstuffs, and drink. Rio says with so much, carrying it all with him will be a little. Elder Sildora gives Rio a space-time cache, but he doesn't want to take it because he feels it's precious. Elder Sildora reminds him that he's their sworn friend. He packs all his luggage into the space-time cache. Rio tells them that if the unthinkable happens, and this village of the spirits faces danger, as their sworn friend, he promises to come running. Latifa wishes him a good trip, and everyone else too. Then he begs them to take care of Latifa, his little sister. Latifa hugs him so tight. Rio manages to reach Yagumo region, and it's been two weeks since he arrived in the area, but he hasn't found any clues about his mother and father. People he can see around also have black hair. Some group of farmers see him, but he talks first. He says he's a traveler, and he's looking for someone. He says he'd like to meet with the head of the village if anyone can help him. Then, a young lady named Ruri signifies that Grandma is the head of the village. Rio asks if she doesn't mind taking him there, or probably showing him the way. She agrees to help him there. Ruri calls Sayo to follow her, or she'll get behind and she quickly gets up to follow her. Ruri helps Ryo to her grandma's house, and she calls on her to come out to see her visitor. Grandma says a visitor who is dressed quite strangely. Ryo quickly introduces himself to the grandma, and says he's come because he was hoping to ask her about something. She asks if he's from some other country, and replies that he's traveled through many lands. Grandma introduces herself as Yuba, and then she asks what his business is here in Yagamo. To be precise, Ryo says he's looking for someone. He's come to this village because he heard that she knows most people in this area. Yuba tells him it's going to be an involved conversation so they find space to sit and discuss. Ryo says he heard that his parents lived in the Yagumo region for over 15 years, and this makes Yuba ask him what his parents' names are, and he says Zen and Ayame. Yuba seems to have heard of the name before, so she asks both Ruri and Sayo to go back to work before she can talk. Then, she asks Ryo to give her a little more detail about his parents. Ryo says he heard that his parents were born in the Yagumo region, but his father died before he was old enough to know him. He lives a peaceful, happy life with his mother, but she died when he was five. He says coming to the Yagumo region is something his mom and he promised to do. Ryo thinks he could find where his parents live as he travels because he'd like to make graves for them, as it's the least he can do for them. Yuba says she knew his parents and she could see the look of them on Ryo's face. Ryo asks her how she knows his parents and she tells him that she's Zen's mother, meaning that she's Ryo's grandmother. She tells him that they already have graves for both of them. Then, she takes him to his parents' graves and he pays his last respects. Yuba says both of them had to leave this country in secret for certain reasons, and there was no possibility that they would come home so, those of us who knew of the true circumstances, made graves for the two of them. Ryo asks for the reason, but Yuba says she cannot be the one to tell him, but the time may come when she'll be able to talk about it. Yuba asks him if he'll live here in the village until that time comes, and he agrees. Yuba says all of her relatives have died, and she has only Ruri with her. Ruri is Ryo's cousin, and she's 15 years old. Ryo says Ruri is a year older than him, and Yuba hums because he seems mature. Yuba says they should head home, but Ryo asks if he could stay at the grave a little longer. Yuba tells him to refrain from addressing her formally, and that he shouldn't stay out late. Yuba says she'll keep his lineage hidden from others for a while. He got late, but Yuba and Ruri prepared him dinner. The next morning, Ryo wakes up early with the motive to start helping with things around the village, and he'd rather start preparing breakfast. Yuba is happy that Ryo is so motivated. Ruri comes to the scene with her body not fully covered, forgetting that they have Ryo at home now, and Ryo faces the other side when she notices that Ruri isn't well covered. She comes to her senses and runs into her room the moment Yuba reminds her that they're not the only ones staying at home now. While Ryo is getting breakfast ready, Yuba says Ruri will make miso soup, but they don't have enough. Ruri says Saye and Shin are coming to their place. Then she points to another container and tells Ryo to use the water from there. She says they refill it every day with spirit arts. Ryo says hot water will be better than plain water, so makes hot water with spirit magic. Ruri finds it amazing that Ryo can do that, and she says even Grandma can't do it. Ryo says he can teach her a little trick to it if she wants, and she gladly says yes. Saye and Shin arrive not long after they serve breakfast, and Yuba introduces them to Ryo. They all have their meal, and Saye and Shin like and enjoy the meal. Ruri tells them Ryo prepares everything, and they're surprised. Ryo tells them they can have more if they want. After the meal, Yuba tells Shin to take Ryo to Dola's place because she was thinking of having Ryo be a hunter, and Dola once mentioned to her that he needs help. 
She says Ryo says he can hunt too, but Shin doubts if Ryo has the stamina for the grueling work. Yuba says considering that he has traveled to many countries at his age and he can use spirit arts, she thinks he's strong enough to do it. Shin immediately says he can even use spirit arts, but Yuba replies that Ryo may be stronger than him. Shim says he's going to take Ryo hunting, but he should make sure he doesn't get in the way. After Ryo and Shin leave for hunting, Ruri turns to Seyo and asks her why Sir Ryo and she says he sort of feels like a noble. Dola, Shin, and Ryo go hunting, and they get to hunt more animals compared to when it was just Dola and Ryo. At the end of the hunting, Dola says they'd be able to give everyone in the village more meat than usual. Ryo kills more animals compared to Shin, who doesn't take down a single one, so he feels it's Ryo and Dola that get these results. But Ryo says it is the three of them working together that get the results. Shin leaves in anger, but Dola tells Ryo he will talk to Shin and then ask him if he can come help starting tomorrow. Ryo says he'll be there. After he gets home, he uses his spirit art to create a bathing space, soap and water, where he has his bath. Sayo and Ruri are surprised to see this, so Ruri asks if he uses spirit to make it, and he says yes, but he can clean it up. Ruri tells him it's fine. Ruri and Sayo like how he smells, so they ask him. He tells them that he made it too. Shin and his friends get there, and they ask what the whole setting is all about, and Sayo tells him that Ryo made the bath. Seems like Shin has begun to develop hate hatred for Ryo. He says outsiders trying to score points. Ruri and Sayo tackle Shin for being rude. Shin shouts at Sayo telling her not to get silly over some weakling, but Sayo claims not to be and Ruri also says Ryo is not a weakling. She added that despite his looks, Ryo's got a lot of muscle. Shin is ashamed and short of words. Ryo goes farming next and these moves are starting to attract the village ladies. At the farm, Yuba seems happy that their crops turned out well this year, and she turns to Ryo to ask him for a favor. She says after the annual tribute and their rations, the rice that remains is to be sold in the royal capital. So she asks if Ryo could guard the transport team, and he says yes. All of a sudden, they see some boys running and shouting that it's Shin and the guys from the other village. A guy named Gon, the son of the head of the neighboring village, and his men have come to disturb the peace of their town, trying to assault Ruri and Sayo, but Shin and his men are there to defend them. Gon says he's on his way to sell trade goods in the royal capital, but unfortunately, his cart broke and it will take time to repair. Ruri says the village will lend him one of their guest huts, but Gon smiles and says he might be her husband, so it's pretty cold of her. Gon sees it as jealousy, that Shin and his men are not Ruri's men, but they're saying they won't allow that. Gon dares Shin to show him what he's got, and Shin gets pissed and decides to fight. Shin tries to attack with his fist, but Gon stops his attack with his palm, grabs his neck, and won't leave it until Yuba and Ryo get there to stop him. So he releases him and Yuba apologizes to him for Shin and the other's misunderstanding, but she blames Gon for his imprudent behavior. Yuba says they will lend him a guest hut at the edge of the village, but he's not allowed to leave it, and he agrees. Gon and his men see Ryo as they leave, and Gon begins to wonder if he's a newcomer, and isn't him at first glance. As he passes Ryo's side, he hits his leg on Ryo's leg, and falls. Ryo asks him if he's alright, and he says nothing, and he leaves. Yuba calms everybody, and tells them to go quietly to their houses, as she's forbidden Gon and his men from leaving the huts. Shin asks Yuba if she will allow Sayo to stay with her for a while. It's just the two of them that live together, but he thinks she'd feel safer staying with Yuda and Ryo. Yuda agrees with him. At night, Ryo gives Ruri and Sayo a protective amulet, and they thank him. Gon and his men are saying something like they made sure to bust the cart well, so they can take all day tomorrow, repairing it at their leisure. Then, Gon says the fun comes after that. The next day, a tax examiner named Saga Hayate and his men come to Madame Yuba's village after a long time. Yuta welcomes him and Ryo introduces himself and welcomes him as well. He examines the crops they've got, and they have him eat with them, and he enjoys it. Ryo is seen with no shirt using a sword to train himself outside, and he notices that he's being watched, and he says, watching like that can't possibly be any fun. Ruri smiles and commends Ryo's movement. Ruri says he started it since the day he got to the town, so she asks him why he started martial arts, but he says it's embarrassing to say. Both ladies say they want to know more. Ryo opts for his shirt, and narrates that when he was little, there was a girl he liked, and he wanted to become strong enough that he could protect her. Ruri asks him what the girl is doing now, but he says they're not in contact anymore. Ryo says she might be with someone she loves, and he doesn't know if she remembers him in the first place. He doesn't know where she lives. Ruri says if she's alive, then they might meet again one day. Ryo says he's training for himself right now. At night, Sayo and Ruri are already asleep when Gon snicks into their room, but Ruri opens her eyes and sees Gon. Gon quickly covers her mouth and says, he's responsible for what happens if she struggles. Sayo wakes up and sees them in drag. Gon advises Sayo not to make a fuss unless he'll punch Ruri in the face, 
and her too. Gon hears his men's voice as they're being knocked down. A light flashes and Ryo happens to be the one who comes in. Ryo meets Gon in the same position where his mom was killed. Gon leaves the ladies to smash Ryo, but he gets smashed by Ryo from inside the building to the outside. Ryo has his leg pinned against Gon's heart until he begs him to stop. Ryo sits on him and smashes his face repeatedly until Lord Hayate comes to hold his hand so he won't kill him. Yuba takes the girls away from the scene, and Lord Hayate seeks punishment from the kingdom, so he orders them to send a messenger. This is Ryo's second time he's wanted to kill someone. As Ryo, he's had this feeling inside him all the time. But one thing is that he's been pulled closer to Amakawa Haruto without him noticing. He hits his fist against a tree and says he turns his eyes away from his revenge, even though he's the same sort of person as that man. The following morning, they get a message that a messenger from the kingdom will arrive, and they decide that Gon and the others will be taken into custody. Well, Ryo apologizes to everyone for causing them such trouble, and Yuba thanks him for protecting Ruri and Sayo. The ladies thank him too, they all laugh and enjoy their breakfast. Through Lord Hayate's influence, Gon and his men will be taken to the royal capital's prison camp, and the village's transport team will be able to set out safely, so Madame Yuba thanks him so much. Lord Hayate says as someone who serves the kingdom, he has only fulfilled his duties as expected of him. Yuba commends him for his sincerity and asks him for a favor to help deliver an important letter to his self-esteemed father, Lord Guki, also Hayate's father. Yuba says she would greatly appreciate it if he could give it to him personally. Lord Hayate agrees to help her deliver it. Then, they take their leave, including Ryo. Several days later, they get to the kingdom of Karasuki, royal capital, and they get a place to stay. Dola advises that they make sure to go out with someone who knows the capital when they leave the premises or else they get lost. After that, he asks if Shin and Ryo will go out with him, and they both agree. Dalo takes Ryo and Shin to a restaurant where he rubs Shin's head and tells him it's time for his emotions to change, and Shin quickly tells Dalo to cut it out because Ryo is watching. The waiter serves them three large servings of Kamutan, but Ryo says he never heard of it. Shin says he'll start craving it once he has it. It was an emotional experience the first time Shin had it, says Dalo. Shin says with Kamutan, slurping it up dynamically is the classy way to do it. Dalo tells Ryo to eat while it's hot before it gets soggy. He takes the food and he likes it. After the meal, Shin and Ryo step out of the restaurant, and Shin thanks him for saving Sayo. They both look at the restaurant, and Shin says he needs to make sure her sister gets to eat this, or else they'll get into another fight. Ryo and Sayo are being sent on an errand, and Ryo asks her if she'd like to go eat some Kamutan with him after the errand. He says Shin asked him to take her if they could manage it. He says they've got into a fight before when he asked her to make it for him, but she couldn't since she had never heard it before. Ryo says her brother just wants to give her the chance to eat some. While they talk, a souvenir seller woman calls on Ryo to get a gift for his cute girlfriend. Sayo quickly says she's not his girlfriend or anything, and the woman says she assumes they look so good together. Then, she asks them to check out just one souvenir of the capital. Ryo asks Sayo if there is anything she wants, but she says she's fine. Ryo says she's done so much for him so she shouldn't mind. The woman turns to Sayo and says at times like this, quietly accepting the gift shows a lady's courteousness. The woman seems to be very good at business, says Ryo. Sayo picks one of the finest items and tries it. The woman asks Ryo what he thinks about it, and Ryo says it suits her. The woman says she sells for two lesser silver tablets, and Sayo starts to react, trying to tell Ryo not to get it. The woman sees her reaction and says she might be able to give just a little discount, but Ryo says he doesn't like to haggle over the price of a gift for a lady. The woman thanked her and wished she had set the price a little higher. As Ryo steps forward to leave, the woman whispers into Sayo's ear that she should do her best to make him hers, because there'll be a lot of competition for him. Some set of guys are trying to get a hold of a lady, and the lady screams that the guys unhand him. A woman is trying to help, but she can't get to the guy holding the lady. Ryo gets to the scene, and follows the guy with the bad who is running. Ryo knocks the guy down and saves the lady. Then he asks Sayo if she's alright. She says yes she's fine. Then the other woman beats the other man and calls Lady Komomo. Ryo says she seems to be unconscious, but he doesn't think there's any risk to her life. The woman apologizes and says it's due to her hopeless incompetence. Ryo gives the lady to her and tells her to apologize to her when she wakes up. Ryo quickly holds Sayo and leaves the spot to avoid any kind of trouble. Lord Guki is reporting to his sin, Hayate, about how Lady Komomo was almost kidnapped, and a young guy who saved Komomo and apprehended the perpetrators quickly departed the scene. Then, he reminds Hayate that he said he wanted a private word, 
Hayate brings out a letter and says, Lady Yuba entrusted him with an important letter. Lord Guki reads the letter and asks Hayate if he met someone named Ryo. Ryo and Sayo come from the errand and meet others cleaning the horses. Sayo calls her brother and says the Kamutan was delicious. Then, Shin tells her that she'll make him some Kamutan when they get back to the village, and she nods. Shin also notices the hairpin on her head and asks about it, but she can't tell. Ryo says he will go and drop the stuff they got inside, and he hears someone call him Lord Ryo, and then he looks back. He sees Lord Hayate, a man and his wife bowing for him. The man introduces himself as Saga Guki, and the woman is Kayoko. Guki tells Ryo that he and his wife were both once attendants of his mother, Lady Karasuki Ayame. Ryo is surprised, and Guki says his surprise is understandable. Guki tells him that his mother was of the royal family of the kingdom of Karasuki. Guki first tells him about his connection to Ryo's father, Zen. He explains that it happened 20 years ago. The Karasuki kingdom was at war with their neighboring kingdom, Rokuren. Zen had a natural gift for both the spirit arts and martial arts, and he volunteered to be a soldier. His majesty, the king soon bestowed upon him the rank of warrior noble. Guki says at that time, he had a bout with him. Guki says his skills were the real thing. Because of that, Guki says he strongly recommended that he should guard members of the royal family. Guki says he's sure Ryo can already guess that the member of the royal family he guarded was Lady Ayame. Lady Ayame took a liking to Zen, and it was at that time that a truce was negotiated with the kingdom of Rokuren. At the ceremony, celebrating the truce, the prince who had come as ambassador took a liking to Lady Ayame and tried to have his attendants and her. Zen kept them from completing their plan, but the prince resented the fact that his attendant had been killed. If the truce were to be finalized, the princess demanded Zen's execution and a political marriage to Lady Ayamu. Even now, Guki says the thought of some makes his blood seethe. Ryo asks if that was the reason why his mother and father ran away together, and Guki says yes. His Majesty the King arranged for it in secret, and the two of them left their country. And so, time flowed on, with no news or contact with them, but today, he received correspondence from Lady Yuba, and having looked upon their honored countenance Lord Ryo, he is certain. There can be no doubt that you're their son. Guki begs and asks Ryo if he can come to the castle the next day, that His Majesty the King and Her Highness the Queen. It's in his dearest wish that Ryo and they might meet. Guk says the two of them, and himself. Ryo says he will. The next day, Ryo gets to the castle and meets King Homura and Queen Shizuku. King Homura says it's a meeting with their darling grandchild, so he asks if it would be possible for Ryo to be less formal with them. Ryo says if they permit it, then he will do his best. Then, they offer him a seat. Queen Shizuku says Ryo looks exactly like Ayame. Ryo replies that it's her who looks just like his mother. Queen Shizuku asks Ryo to tell them about Ayame and Zen. To cut straight to the conclusion, Ryo says both of them have already died. King Homura says it is how they died, and how they lived that they'd like to hear. Ryo says his father when he was too young to know him, while his mother was a kind person who never stopped smiling. She never showed him her grief at her father's death. Ryo says they were by no means affluent, but every day was a happy one. But she passed when she passed. King Homura asks Ryo how Ayami died. Ryo says if he tells them the truth, it will be incredibly painful to hear, but the king says they want to know. Ryo says his mother was killed right in front of him. He says the name of the person who killed her is a man named Lucius. He had worked with his father as an adventurer. After his father's death, he'd help them in many ways. But that day, his mother steps out and says she'll be back soon. She also says he shouldn't open the door. Ryo eventually opened the door for a man named Lucius. He hit Ryo with his leg, and he hit his head on a chair. Lucius brings out a container containing some liquid to feed Ryo. As he forces him, Ayame enters and shouts Ryo. Lucius grabs her and stabs her to death right in front of him, and he found himself in the slum when he woke up. He stayed and lived there as an orphan till he was seven. Then, he explains an incident where he happened to rescue someone of importance to the kingdom. He was allowed to attend an educational institution run by the kingdom, where some of the students were treated a little harshly, but some people treated him well, thanks to them. He attended the school till he was 12, and then he set out for this land that his mother had promised to show him one day. King Homura says both his parents must harbor a deep hatred for them. Ryo says he thinks his mother was grateful to them for being able to marry his father. He says it would make no sense for him to hate them in the face of that. Ryo says that the man who kills his mother is the one person he will never forgive. King Homura asks if he hopes for revenge, and he says once, that was all that kept him alive, but revenge doesn't create anything. He says even so if he ever met that man with his hands. King Homura tells him if he travels the path of revenge, what he will find is hell. Ryo says he will proceed because he's determined to proceed even if it's necessary, he would not hesitate to dirty his own hands. King Homura says he won't stop him but before then, he would like him to spar with Guki, 
because he'd require strength if he's to one day face Lucius. Guki and Ryo come home when they see Lei Komomo, who happens to be Guki's daughter, and he happens to be the one who saved Lady Komomo. Guki and his wife are glad and surprised. The fight between Guki and Ryo Kayoko to officiate the fight, and the king and queen are present too. Both Guki and Ryo begin to show some wonderful sword skills to attack each other till Guki decides to chant, Hidden skill, first blade air splash to strike Ryo, but he defends himself with his spirit art. At the end of the match, the bout goes to Lord Ryo. The king and the queen find his performance impressive. The king asks him if there's anything he'd wish for, and he says he has a cousin who lives in the village where he's been staying, and he'd like to tell her about his lineage, but the king says they'll trust his judgment in this and he thanks them. The villagers are back to the village but Ruri can't find them. Sayo calls Ruri to look up at the mountain, where he tells his parents that he can't run anymore. To live, to protect what's precious, he will accept the ugliness within me and move forward. On the night of the same day of arrival to the village, Yuba and Ryo tell Ruri who Ryo is, but Ruri is surprised to hear that Ryo is her cousin. It's probably hard to believe that, so she makes a joke about it. Yuba says it isn't officially acknowledged, but Ryo is of the royal family. She added that Ryo's father gained recognition during the war, and was raised to the rank of warrior noble, and the story is known to all of the elderly folks in the village. Ruri apologizes for her rudeness and bows to Ryo, after she is convinced enough by Yuba. Ryo isn't convenient and used with formality, so she tells her not to do that. Ruri says he's royalty, and Ryo says his mother may have been, but he's not, so she begs Ruri to treat him like she used to. She asks if she could call him Ryo, and he says, of course, he hopes to continue their relationship. Then she says they're cousins. Calling her Miss Ruri is a little awkward, so she wants him to refer to her more familiarly. Ryo agrees, although it's going to take a while for him. Ryo tells both of them that he's thinking of leaving this village by this time next year, and Yuba says he will be missed but it can't be helped. Yuba asks him if he'd return to the land he grew up in, and he says yes, but there's somewhere I'd like to stop by along the way too. Ruri asks him if he'll come back to this village again someday, and he says if it's permitted, I'd like to come back one day. Ruri says he's of course permitted, and Yuba added that he's a member of this village so he can come back any day. Ruri thinks that since Ryo says he's going to stop by somewhere, maybe someone is waiting for him there. Ryo says they aren't related by blood, but there's someone who thinks of him as an older brother. Ryo meets with Ruri and Sayo at their spot and he addresses Ruri as they've agreed to do it. Then he mentions that he hasn't said hello to everyone since he came back, so he wants to go around and see everybody properly. Ruri says all right. Then she notices the expression on Sayo and the other ladies' faces, and she asks them what. Sayo says the manner of speaking. A lady walks up to him to ask him why he is speaking with Miss Ruri that way like it's normal. Ruri manages to tell them that they're both living in the same house so she just asks him to stop using all that formal language. Other ladies are jealous, saying they want that too. He continues his everyday activities in the village, and he's enjoying his time with the villagers. At the farm, Ruri calls on Ryo to tell him that she has planted the seedlings in her area just the way he asked her to. Ryo commends her and tells her to help others who haven't finished theirs. Dalo cuts in and says, Ruri's so hardworking, so she'll make a good bride, and Ryo says he thinks so. Both Ryo and Dalo laugh it out when she says they shouldn't her like that. Then, Ryo turns to Miss Sayo and asks if he could help her, but she quickly continues her planting and says she isn't paying attention. Ryo tells her to make sure she remembers everything. Besides, he'd like to supervise everyone in the village in what he's taught after he's gone. Sayo hears this and pauses, and Ryo says that it all depends on whether it turns out well. She asks Ryo if he's leaving their village, and he says yes. He says he hasn't told anyone else yet. But this fall, around the time the harvest festival ends, that's when he is thinking of going. She asks if he's staying close and would come back to the village regularly, but he says he's planning to travel across the country, so he doesn't know if he'll be able to come back regularly. He feels it's better to inform her far ahead before then. Sayo is worried but doesn't want Ryo to notice this, so she claims that dirt from her hands gets into her eyes. Ryo creates water spirit art and gives her to wash her face. Ruri asks her what happened, and she tells her the same thing she told Ryo. Then she says she'd better get to finish up her section, and Ruri says she'd help. Sayo gets home that day and bursts into tears until Shin comes into the house to see his sister crying, so he asks her what's wrong with her. She claims to be fine and would go make dinner, but it's obvious that it's not dinner time. Shin thinks it is Ryo that made her cry, so he's about to step out in anger when Sayo tells him Ryo didn't do anything but just that Ryo's leaving the village. Shin quickly steps out of the house to go to Madame Yuba's place to look for Ryo, 
On getting there, he sees Ryo and bows before him, begging him to stay in the village. He says he knows what he's saying is selfish, yet he shouldn't leave the village. Sayo gets there and apologizes for whatever trouble her brother might have caused them. They both apologize and they leave for their house. It's finally the Harvest Festival. Everyone is happy enjoying their moment, and Madame Yuba invites the Guki family to have fun with them. Guki decides to do a challenge with anyone who's got confidence in his skills, and he says rank and size have no meaning. While some people hail Guki, some people push Dola to the stage to challenge Guki, even though he doesn't want to. Guki wins at the end of the challenge. Ryo makes everyone Kamutan. Ruri invites Komomo to come have Kamutan. Ryo thanks Lady Kayoko for her help today, and she says it is the least she could return. Then, Sayo asks if she could have a moment with him so they move away from the party spot to discuss. Ryo sees the hairpin and says she's still using it. Then, she gets to the main conversation, which might seem burdensome, but she has to say it. She says she's in love with Ryo. Ryo feels sorry, but he can't return her feelings. She asks if it's because he's leaving the village, and he says yes, but not the whole reason. Then, she says Ryo should take her with him. Ryo says it's not possible, and she says she works hard, so that she won't slow Ryo down. She says she's trained her body and practiced her spirit arts every day for the last six months. She says she'll do everything she can not to hold him back. Ryo insists that it's not an issue at all. He says again that he's sorry and can't return her feelings. Water rushes down her face and she says, it's all right even if Ryo never looks at her, even if he never does anything for her, but he should at the very least let her stay by his side. She holds Ryo's hand, but Ryo feels sorry and lets off his hand and leaves the scene. As he leaves, he notices Shin watching, so he stops and quietly says, he's sorry Master Shin. Ryo is set to leave, so he's thanking both Madame Yuba and Ruri, but Madame Yuba says he doesn't need to set out when it's still so dark. Ryo says he finished his goodbyes with everyone in the village yesterday, and it's going to be a long journey. Ruri tells him that he can come back home anytime. Ryo leaves as they wish him a good trip. Seiyo is waiting for Ryo at the border of the village. She remembers what Lord Guki told her while Ryo left her crying. She wishes Ryo the best, and tells him to take good care of himself and he says yes, and hopes that she will too. She says she's going to work hard, she'll do her best, so he has to do his best too. Ryo tells her he's truly happy that she's come to see him off. They both shake hands and wish each other goodbye until they meet again. Ryo flies back to meet the Demi-Humans and Latifa. Latifa runs into him to give him a welcome back tight hug, and he says he's back. He tells the elders that he was able to have a lot of good experiences. He explains it all to them. Ryo tells Latifa that his grandmother and cousin said they wanted to meet her when he told them he has a little sister, and she says she might want to meet them too. Elder Sildora asks Ryo how long he'll be able to stay with them this time, and he says a few months at most. He promises Latifa to make sure he comes back more quickly this time. Elder Ursula asks Ryo if there's anything he finds himself running short of on his journey. Ryo says he still has plenty in the way of supplies, but as he was traveling, a thought did occur to him so he was hoping that she might lend him her wisdom. She asks him to go ahead. Then, he says he was thinking about building a house he could take with him in the space-time cache. Dominic finds it interesting, but Ursula says he would want a house that could be set in place without a foundation. Dominic says he'd have to use spirit arts to prepare the ground every time. Elder Sildora says, once he likes this, he won't return for some time. Ursula tells Rio to leave the house to Dominic, so in the meantime, he should spend all the time he can with Latifa and the others. After the discussion with the elders, he meets the ladies in the room. Sarah asks him if he was able to have a nice long talk with the eldest, and he says yes. Then he says he's relieved to see that everyone seems as sprightly as ever. Sarah says the elders must have been surprised to see how grown up he's got. Rio says it right because it's been two years. Orphea says Rio has grown so much that Alma and Sarah seem to have gotten quite shy around him, but they both claim not to be shy. Rio tells both Alma and Sarah that they've become more like grown ladies, and they are lovely. He turns to Orphea to tell her that she's become more beautiful, and that calm aura of hers has only grown. Then, Latifa asks him if he'd take a bath with them, and the ladies shout, of course he doesn't. Rio wakes up from bed and finds a naked lady next to him, so he shouts so loud that the ladies break into the room to ask what the matter is. The ladies are surprised by what they see, but Rio is trying to explain to them that he doesn't even understand either. All the ladies are complete, so they ask him who the lady is, but he insists that it's a misunderstanding. Then, the lady changes her position to move closer to Rio, which makes the ladies so curious to want to know who she is. Miss Sarah says it's a misunderstanding. Master Rio is simply sleeping with a naked woman, that's all. And the ladies have seen something they are not supposed to see, 
and she apologizes. Latifa asks who she is, and Rio wakes the lady to ask who is. She opens her eyes and says, she's a spirit, the spirit who formed a covenant with Haruto. She explains to all of them who she is, and it reminds Rio of what Lady Dryas told him about bonded spirit. Rio then asks her how they both form a covenant, but she doesn't know either. Rio says when he was still small, it was the lady who showed him how to use spirit arts, and she still doesn't know. Rio asks her why she suddenly appears here, but she doesn't know either. Rio asks her if that's what happens when a bonded spirit first appears, and Miss Sarah says the spirits they're bonded with aren't person-shaped, so they don't know. Rio turns to the lady to ask her her name, but she says she doesn't know her name. The lady says she wants a name because she's by Haruto Rio's side. Rio asks her why he has to be the one to name her, and she says because she exists for him. Orphea notices the lady has been calling him Haruto this whole time but Ryo says he'll explain to them later. The lady knows about Ryo. She mind talks him that she knows everything about him. The lady says she can speak if it's with him. Ryo asks her if she means everything about Amakawa Haruto when she says everything. She asks in surprise if it was the Haruto he was before he became this Haruto. Ryo says it seems she knows everything, and she says he shouldn't worry, she won't tell others. She asks if it would be better if she calls him Ryo. He smiles and says she can call him by either name. Ryo asks her if she's alright with him giving her a name. She insists insists she wants a name he gives her, and Ryo asks if she'd give her a little time, and she says yes. Ryo feels like this is happening so fast, so he doesn't know what to do. Sarah asks if he could ask Eldest and Lady Dryas for advice. Alma says Lady Dryas is a person-shaped spirit, so she may have some counsel for him. Ryo turns to the lady to ask her if she'd go with him, but what dress would she wear? She stands up, and a nice dress automatically covers her up. Everyone in the room is surprised, and she says she wove the dress from Odd and Mana. She changes her dress, and Ryo doesn't know when the name Aishia comes out of his mouth. The lady seems to like the name, and she says in the ancient language of their village, it can mean warm springtime or beautiful springtime. Ryo says when he looks at her, the image of spring just seems to fit, and she confesses that she likes it. She says spring is like the Haru in Haruto. Alma is the first to wish to welcome her, and asks if she should treat her like an older sister, and then others welcome her too. At the council hall, they decide to inform the elders about Ryo's bonded spirit who's awakened suddenly, and the elders wonder why the spirit has lost her memory. Ryo is about to explain his covenant with the spirit to the elders when Lady Dryas appears, and her reason for appearance is that she felt a powerful spirit appear within the village's barrier. She recognizes the spirit, and they both introduce themselves. Lady Dryas tells all that it's appropriate for person-shaped spirits to keep their memories from before their elevation. She asks Aishia if she remembers the kind of spirit she was, and she claims to be Haruto's bonded spirit. This brings up a question of who Haruto is, but Ryo says there's a bit of a situation regarding that, and he confesses that he calls himself Haruto in the Stral region, and he's wanted by the authorities. Lady Dryas suggests they identify the kind of spirit Aishia, so she asks Aishia to tell the element she's best at, and she replies that she's good at all elements. They're all surprised to hear that Aishia is proficient with spirit arts of every element, even Lady Dryas. Then, they decide to set up a fight between Ryo and Aishia to gain an understanding of how much power Aishia has, especially Ryo. Ryo holds a stone and tells Aishia that their fight begins once the stone hits the ground. Ryo throws the stone and it hits the ground, and then the battle commences. Aishia's technique of fighting is fast, and Ryo notices her movement so he wonders if she traced and copied his techniques. The fight is an intense type. They both use different spirit arts in the battle, one of which Alma can tell is used to defeat the Black Wyvern. Then, Ryo and Aishia unleash massive tornadoes that Lady Dryas has to end the match before any form of attack from both ends may affect the village. From Aishia's performance, they can tell that she's truly capable of every element. Lady Dryas says from what she saw, that Aishia only uses a fraction of what she has, and as it is now, she thinks Aishia is unsafe. Lady Dryas says she'll impart the knowledge about spirits, to Aishia starting from the moment. Elder Sildora welcomes Aishia on behalf of the people of the spirits. They have a feast to welcome Aishia to their village, and Ryo takes her all around the village to show her unique things. Elder Dominic takes Ryo and others to the house he's helped Ryo build, which has different facilities including a stone-lined bath, etc. Elder Dominic tells Ryo that as long as a foundation is set with spirit arts, the house can be set up wherever he wants. Ryo thanks him, but he hits Ryo softly and tells him not to act like they're strangers. Since Elder Dominic's completed the house he can carry with him, Ryo thinks he needs to pay his respects to the elders, meaning it's about time for him to depart. Latifa asks him when he's going, and he says the day after tomorrow. 
Elder Dominic says he'll inform the other elders and they'll meet at the council hall. As they enter the new house, Rio notices Sarah's mood, and he feels sorry for the sudden departure. Sarah tells him to spend a little time talking with Latifa. At night, Rio is seen in the bath, thinking about himself as being thoughtless. He's been focused on his spirit arts training since Aisha awakened, but he hasn't been talking with Latifa as much. Just in a moment, Latifa comes in in a bath towel with the motive to wash Rio's back since he's leaving the day after tomorrow, but Rio isn't comfortable with the fact that she's not putting on clothes. In the end, he allows her to wash his back, and she reminds him that she used to be Japanese. Her name back then was Endo Suzune, and Rio asks why she decided to mention it all of a sudden. She says, Aishia calls her Haturo. He tells her it was his alias in the Stral region. Rio tells her that his name was Amakawa Haruto, when he lived in Japan before he reincarnated. Latifa says she used to take a bus, and there was someone she wished was her big brother, who took the same bus as her every day. But the bus got into an accident. Rio can tell now that they happened to be involved in the incident. She says Rio is a wonderful brother, but Rio doesn't feel like that because he's not with her anymore. Latifa hugs him immediately and tells him to make sure he comes home to the village. Rio promises to come back if Latifa is waiting for him. She's so happy to hear that, and she asks if there's anywhere that needs more rinsing, and they make a joke out of it. Rio tells her that there's something he has to do in the Stral region, and Latifa tells him not to mention that she understands. The next morning, Rio is set to leave the village for Stral region, and he's escorted by the elders and the other ladies. Elder Ursula gives him a teleportation crystal, a magic item that allows the user to teleport back to the village easily. Elder Dominic tells him that it only works in one direction, so it can't take him back to where he came from. They consider him a sworn friend, and to learn a sworn friend set out on a journey empty hand would sully the name of the people of the spirits. Elder Sildora gives a magical item that will allow him to change the color of his hair at will. As he is a wanted man in Stral, the magical item will prove useful. Lady Dryas reminds Ashia not to forget what she's taught her. Then, Rio tells Sarah to look after his little sister, but Latifa claims not to be a child anymore. They all wish him a safe trip. On their way to Stral, Rio says there's something he has to do in Stral, but before then, he needs to meet someone. And Aishia says, Celia. She seems to know everything. Rio says he hasn't been able to communicate with her after the first letter. Back at Beltram Academy, Celia is seen in the school compound, thinking and wondering if Rio is safe wherever he is, as she is always holding the letter she ever got from him. All of a sudden, Lord Charles is surprised, and she calls him Lord Charles, but he asks why she won't call him darling. Celia says she can't because she's too shy to do something like that. Well, Lord Charles hopes she changes with time. Then, one of Lord Charles's guards calls for him to see something. Then, he leaves. Rio and Aisha find their way to Beltran, royal capital of the Beltram Kingdom, but it seems crowded compared to how it used to be. To avoid being noticed by anyone, he uses the magical earring to change his hair color. They decide to stop at a woman's shop, get something from her, and use the opportunity to ask why there are a lot of people passing by. And the woman says it's because there's going to be a noble's wedding parade the next day. So, lots of people have come from outside the royal capital. Rio is curious so he asks nobles from which house, and she says the Duke Arbor's house, one of the great noble houses. Rio tells Aisha that he's going to the academy next. But Aisha says she'll go with him as her spirit form might be useful for them when they're out there. At night, when they arrive at the academy, they land on a roof adjacent to the entrance of the academy, with some guards staying open and alert. Rio takes them through a window he used to unlock easily, but couldn't, so Aisha quickly uses her spirit form to appear on the opposite side, to open it from inside for Rio. They find their way to Celia's research lab, but it's empty, so Rio wonders if she has changed lab, because he knows she wouldn't quit the academy. Rio says it's a bit of a risk. But if there are researchers in any of the other rooms, they can use illusions and ask them. Aisha tells him to leave it to her. Rio finds another research lab in the academy, and Rio knocks at the door. When the man in the lab asks who's knocking, Aisha appears at his back and touches him so he won't recognize Rio. Rio comes in and asks him where Celia Clare is, that he has some business with her, and the man replies that she's in the royal palace. The man tells him that Celia is getting married to Lord Charles of the House of Duke Arbor. Rio seems out when he hears the news. Rio is surprised. Celia is getting married to Charles Arbor, so he asks the man how it gets to be like that. The man says in the last conflict, the Kingdom of Beltram suffered a crushing defeat by the Proxia Empire, but with the actions of the House of Duke Arbor, they just barely managed to commence negotiations for peace. But the power and authority of the royal family were lost. Then, Duke Huguenot's faction was made to take responsibility so they fled the royal capital. The House of Duke Arbor has rallied its momentum, 
and what they have chosen to once gain strength is the house of Count Clare. Aisha asks the man if the house of Count Clare desires this political marriage, but the man says he doesn't know that he doesn't have such detailed information. Aisha takes her hand off the man, and he sleeps off. Outside the building above the roof, Aisha asks Rio what he'd do, and he says he has to see Celia, and asks her in person before the marriage happens the next day. But Celia is in the castle, and there is every possibility that their defense will be even tighter than the academy. Aisha says she'll use her spirit form to investigate. Rio says, a spirit in spirit form is a mass of oud and mana, and something inside the castle may be set to detect suspicious magical power. Aisha says she can visually perceive barriers that are made to detect magic. As she leaves, Rio is about to say that she and Celia haven't met before, but she says she knows what she looks like. Rio tells her he's counting on her. At the castle, Lord Charles, Celia, and her father are having dinner. Then her father feels sorry that he hasn't been able to come to see her until now. Celia believes her father is busy with official matters, so she tells him not to mention. Lord Charles interrupts them. He calls Count Clare. Celia's father and says he supposes he should be calling him father now. He tells him to set his mind at ease that the preparations for the ceremony are complete. Count Clare says he heard that the ceremony will be a large event, and Lord Charles says, of course, it's a wedding between their house of Duke Arbor and the house of Count Clare. Count Clare expects the security to be flawless, and he tells the Knights of the Royal Guard, the Mage Corps, and others he's gathered their kingdom's very best. Count Clare, who was worried about everything, is relieved now. Lord Charles tells him that they're worried about him, instead of him worrying for them. He says strange rumors have been flowing from the royal court that Count Clare and a portion of the nobles have been secretly in contact with Duke Huguenot, who fled the kingdom. Count Clare says the slander is completely unfounded, but Lord Lord Charles says it is true that trust in him has been shaken. Count Clare says he will never betray this kingdom. Lord Charles tells him not to worry, because his marriage to Celia is partly to help protect his standing. He then says they will soon have Count Clare serve as commander and director of the House of Duke Arbor. That sounds like a threat to Count Clare, but he has no choice. So he agrees to do everything in his power to fulfill this responsibility. Then, they cheer for the peace and prosperity of both houses and the beautiful bride. Celia says they're in Lord Charles's care, as she and her father will both dedicate themselves entirely to this. Lord Charles looks forward to the wedding ceremony tomorrow. Rio is far high above the castle, looking at how strong the defense in the castle is, and he is not surprised that he sees it like he already thought. It's in preparation for tomorrow. Aisha mind talks him that she's found where Celia is, which is outside the palace. She tells Rio to start at the main gate. On the left, a fair way in, there's a large building. Rio set out to head there. Celia is inside her room, thinking about how long she and her father have seen each other, not to mention speaking as parent and child at all. All. For her father and the House of Clare to be all right, all that is left is for her to become Lord Charles's property for the rest of her life. Then she opens her drawer to bring out Rio's letter and wishes she could see him again. She thinks her feelings for Rio are… She opens the envelope, brings out the letter to burn it, and then Rio enters her room. He pulls off what he used to cover his head, and uses the magical earring to turn his hair back to black. She's so surprised by him again, the least she expected. Rio says he's come back as promised although it took him four years to do it. She drops the letter and hugs Rio so tight. Celia can tell now that it isn't a dream, and they both tell each other they've missed each other. Celia tells Rio that he has grown taller, and Rio says she hasn't changed very much at all, but she claims to have grown a little more womanly. Then, Rio tells her that she's always been beautiful, but she's grown even more lovely. She beats Rio's chest for saying things like that again. From the sound, while she beats his chest, she says Rio's grown dashing, strong, and gallant. She confesses that she's glad he comes back safe and sound. Then she wonders how Rio gets into her room. Rio smiles, and then she asks Rio to tell her about his trip to the Yagumo region and everything. She asks if Rio would like to have some tea so they can have it like they used to. While she prepares the tea, Rio mentions that he heard she's getting married to Charles Arbor, and she replies, yes. Rio asks her if the wedding is something she wants, and he feels sorry to have pushed such a question to her. Celia says the wedding is something she's agreed to. And Rio asks even though the person she's marrying is Charles Arbor. She says that Charles Arbor is someone Rio has an ill-fated connection with, and Rio replies he thought perhaps it might have something to do with the circumstances of her family. Celia says no, she's of age, she can't think only of her research forever. She added that despite his appearance, Charles Arbor is chivalrous and kind toward women. Rio wants to say another word, and she interrupts him, and asks him if he will marry her instead or take her somewhere, and live the rest of his life with her. Rio doesn't know what to say, so she says she was just kidding that they should forget all of that. Then she says Rio should leave because the people who look after her will be there soon. She added that she has an early day tomorrow, and there are a lot of preparations left. She's glad to see Rio before her wedding ceremony, 
and she tells Ryo not to come to the ceremony because it will be too embarrassing. She tells Ryo to hurry and go and be careful not to get caught as he leaves. She says she'll close the door and give him 20 seconds to go. She threatens to scream if he doesn't leave. She pushes him out and counts. Before she knew it, he already left. She's glad to see him again as promised, but she doesn't want Ryo to get caught up in this. She ends it all with bye-bye, Ryo. Ryo tells Aishia that he wasn't able to find out her true feelings, and she asks him what he tends to do. Ryo says he doesn't know, but he wants to know a little more about what's motivating this wedding. Then, Aisha says she will help him, but he says sorry, and she asks her why he apologizes. Then he says, because all he does is have her to help him. She reminds him that she said she would always be at his side. She says he can come to her anytime he needs her. On the wedding day, Cerise pays a visit to Charles Arbor to congratulate him. Charles Arbor asks him when he arrives, and he just arrived. Lord Charles says if he'd known earlier that Cerise would be staying, he'd have provided a proper welcome. Cerise tells him not to trouble himself. Cerise tells him if he's too friendly with him, some people would not be amused, so he'd like to keep his visit quiet. Lord Charles tells Sir Rice to come to his home once the ceremony is over. Sir Rice tells him tonight is his first night together, so he'll visit another day. As they talk, Sir Rice can sense a powerful spirit, so he gets carried away, until Lord Charles calls his name to ask if he's good, but he says it's all good. Then, Sir Rice says he will go to the ceremony hall early and wait there. Lord Charles calls on one of his guards to show Sir Rice to the ceremony hall. After a while, he can't sense it again, meaning that it's disappeared. Celia is dressed, looking at herself in the mirror. Then she hears someone call her name to come out for a moment. When she comes, Lord Charles and others who see her love the way she looks in her dress. He introduces her to his wives to meet them so that they can become friends. Then, he tells his first wife, Tennessina, to take care of the rest, and he leaves. Tennessina moves closer to her to introduce herself, and tells her that there's something she'd like to make clear from the beginning. She says Celia, daughter of Count Clare, would be superior to them in social standing, but once she's married Lord Charles, as his seventh wife, her place amongst them is at the very bottom. She added that she wouldn't allow any impertinent behavior, and Celia agreed to the terms. Celia says she's inexperienced and inept, but she hopes the older wives will look at her kindly. Tennessina says her complexion looks terrible, and she should try to smile more brightly. All of a sudden, Celia's maid comes in to inform Celia that Her Highness Princess Christina, first princess of the realm, is here, and Celia tells her maid to let her through right away. Tennessina is not good with the fact that she left her to attend to her maid, but she apologizes to her. The maids and other wives honor Princess Christina as she comes in, and she apologizes to Celia for arriving so suddenly, with no prior notice. Celia thanks Princess Christina for coming. Princess Christina commends Celia's wedding dress and she thanks her. Tennessina turns to Princess Christina and welcomes her, telling her to come inside and rest at her leisure. Princess Christina says she is hoping to speak with her former teacher, Professor Celia, in private. Tennessina quickly apologizes for her behavior and takes the other ladies with her. Princess Christina says she's come to offer congratulations in place of her mother and father. Now they're seated inside having some tea. She never stops commending her professor, and she says her complexion looks a little better than it did earlier. She asks if those individuals say something unpleasant to her. But Celia says no. She was just so nervous yesterday that she didn't sleep well. She thanks the professor because, with her help, she's finally able to be outside like this. Princess Christina confesses that she's been confined in the palace for so long, and Celia says the scrutiny of Duke Arbor's faction is quite stringent. Princess Christina says in her case, the inadequacy of the royal family is the cause of it. She believes Flora feels the same. Celia tells her that when Duke Huguenot fled the kingdom with Princess Flora, it must have been painful. Princess Christina says it made her see that all faith in the power of the royal family had been lost, and the ill effects of that have resulted in Celia's wedding. Princess Christina feels sorry for all of this, but Celia claims that the wedding is something she decided upon, so she doesn't need to apologize. Princess Christina says that she has stolen her smile from her. She explains that while she attended the academy, she admired and looked up to Celia, because back then, she seemed so clearly happy, unlike now. Now, she looks like a bird locked in a cage. She then says if there were a chance for her to regain the smile she had back then, she swears to do everything in her power to help when the time comes. Celia thanks her and prays that Princess Christina and Princess Flora will one day be reunited. Lord Charles and Alfred are seen having a conversation about Alfred gloriously taking command of the assembled forces, meaning that he's the strongest warrior in the kingdom. Lord Charles tells him that his skills have given him the king's sword, but unfortunately, he has authority over the security for the ceremony, so Alfred has no choice but to obey his orders. Alfred says he only ever thinks of how he might fulfill his bounden duty. However, Lord Charles tells him not to go showing, and he leaves. The wedding ceremony between Professor Celia and Charles Arbor begins, and people all over the kingdom praise and welcome Lord Charles and Professor Celia as they're being driven by a cart 
followed by different forces of the army huntering their precincts. People can see Celia's dress through the cart shade, so they call her Silverbride. Lord Charles says Silverbride coming from ignorant peasants is not a bad appellation, but it shows how very beautiful Celia is. Then he says when he thinks that Celia will be his and his alone very soon, he looks forward to the moment they kiss to seal their oats. He makes a sign to one of the soldiers on a horse, and then the soldier hails long, live the house of Arbor, and the different forces hail the same, so as the people of the kingdom. Lord Charles then says one one day this kingdom will be his, and Celia will be his wife. As the cart approaches, Aishia informs Rio, and thanks to Aishia, Rio is calm. Aishia mind talks to Celia, while she waves to people shouting and hailing her. Aishia introduces herself, and tells her Rio is sending her. She tells her to look to her right, and she does, and she sees Rio among the crowd. She questions why he's there because she told him not to show up. She cries and says, Rio is the one person she doesn't want to see like this. Lord Charles notices Celia is crying, and she asks her why, but she says maybe so many feelings suddenly welled up. Lord Charles says he didn't realize Celia cared for him this much. Then, he tells her that they must be dignified here because every Everybody is watching. She then looks at the back if she'd see Rio, but he's gone. She tries to mind talk to Aisha, but nothing is well. She thinks it could be all a fantasy. The cart stops, and Lord Charles stands up and puts forward his hand to pick Celia up so they can step forward. Celia says she's a doll and is about to meet Lord Charles's hand when the soldiers shout, Halt! There's an intruder and the intruder happens to be Rio. As he approaches his highest speed, some soldiers attempt to stop him, but he hits any of them who stand in his way with his legs and fist. A soldier on a horse orders the soldiers to fall back to the side and form a single file wall, and they shouldn't let him get close. The soldiers set themselves with spears pointing toward Rio, but he unleashes his magic to wipe them off the floor. The soldier on the horse orders the mage squad to contain him, and the mage squad chants Photon Bullet and unleashes it, but Rio dodges it all and flies high over many of the soldiers. The soldier on the horse orders some soldiers to protect the bride and groom. The soldier chants enchants physical ability, and they set to attack Rio as he lands. They chant, encircle, and capture him. Celia is surprised, but Lord Charles tells her that everything is fine, and that it's just a nice show before the ceremony. They are the elite among the elite of their kingdom, the chosen few with proven pedigrees and skills. Rio has already taken down all the soldiers by the time he looks up. Before Lord Charles realizes this, Rio flies toward him, hits him in the chest with his fist, and falls to the ground. Rio brings a knife and acts like he's going to injure Celia. Count Claire doesn't want his daughter to be hurt, so he wants to move, but a soldier stops him, but he tells her to unhand him, as he isn't expecting the security to be flawless. The soldier tells him to calm down and not to provoke the insurgent. Duke Arbor tries to move as well, but a soldier stops him. Rio mind talks to Professor Celia. He apologizes for the disturbance, but while those around them are in turmoil, he'd like her to explain the situation. He says if she would keep quiet for a little while, it would be a great help. She asks Rio what is going on and Rio tells her he is speaking directly into her consciousness through telepathy. She just needs to focus her words in her mind and her voice will reach him. Lord Charles who is lying on the floor asks what he's looking for, but Rio crushes his back with his leg and says he has a grievance with him. He threatens to crush his spine completely under his foot. Celia tells him to stop and he tells her that he won't kill anyone but an act that is part of the disturbance. Sir Alfred orders the soldiers to take the guests into the inner sanctum. Rio tells Celia that they don't have much time, so she should let him finish explaining quickly. He says before she's wed, he asks her what her will is once more, but she won't let out the direct answer, so Rio knows that she's being half-threatened into this by Duke Arbor's house. Rio tells her that whatever her wish is, it will be done. She says Rio's being domineering, and he agrees domineering and arrogant. He tells her she's so precious to him, and he owes her so much. He doesn't want to just stand by and lose what's important to him. He knows he'd regret it for the rest of his life. He says once something is lost, it will never come back, but if one hasn't lost it yet, then there's still time. He says he sees a future where her dignity will be trampled on for the rest of her life. Then, he asks her again if the marriage will make her happy. Then, she says that if she puts her feelings before all else, she may cause trouble for others. She asks if that would be the right thing to do. But Rio doesn't know. But if this wedding is truly the right thing to do, then she wouldn't have that look on her face. He begs her not to give up. She asks him for his plans if she says she doesn't want to get married, and he says he'll take her and run away from this place. That way, no one will question whether her father is involved. Celia looks and sees that they've been surrounded by an army of soldiers, so he tells Rio that they will catch him. Rio tells her not to worry about it, but he will make her wish come true. He lets her know that it's something someone holding a knife to her throat should be saying. Then, she tells Rio to take her away. Rio faces Lord Charles and tells him that he has decided to abduct his bride right before everyone's eyes. Then, 
he grabs Celia and runs away, while Celia shouts, Lord Charles. Lord Charles orders all troops to go after him and capture him. Sir Alfred tells them to hold, and they should not break any information. Lord Charles orders them to catch Rio immediately. The soldiers run after him to catch him, but he flies above them and lands on the other end. Lord Charles screams the soldiers are incompetent, as they can't get a hold of just one man. Sir Alfred asks Lord Charles if he sees Rio's jumping ability when he charges it. The mage squad chants Photon Bullet and unleashes it again. But Rio drops Celia and creates a barrier that stops the threats. Sir Rice thought Rio was using some kind of magical item, but spirit arts. Then he wonders who the person could be until he remembers a boy who cut off the head of a huge monster in the forest using spirit arts, so he thinks he's come back. He can tell that he's gotten stronger since the last time he saw him. Then he unleashes an attack on Rio but Rio controls it and hits the attack on the floor, and it blasts, so people yell thinking Rio and Celia are dead, but when the blast settles, Rio is seen holding Celia in his hand, and he runs away. Lord Charles orders that they stop firing because he doesn't want the attack to affect Celia. While Lord Charles screams, Sir Alfred tells the soldiers to listen up. He tells them that their aerial knights are now in pursuit, so he orders the forces to immediately spread out in a net that encircles the capital. He turns to Vanessa and tells her to handle the security of the wedding venue and coordinate between the captains of each unit. Lord Charles calls on Alfred to ask him the person who permitted him to take command, and now he's let the raider get away with his wife-to-be. Sir Alfred asks him if he has any idea who the insurgent might be. Lord Charles remembers the insurgent said he had a grievance with him. Alfred says it sounds like there may be a lot of candidates, but Lord Charles tells him to shut up, chase the insurgent immediately, and bring him back. Sir Alfred says that is his intent, and he runs after the insurgent. The situation has become an entertaining one to Sir Rice, but with the protection afforded to him as an ambassador, he supposes he shouldn't slip away from here. He happens to be very interested in Rio, and the spirit that never showed itself. As they run, Celia complains that Rio is too fast, but Rio tells her to please hold up, and he'd rather not deal with Griffin's unit, so he's going to go a little faster. She says Rio has grown into quite an impressive boy. He thanks her, and asks if she's gotten a little more used to the speed. She says if he can go faster, then he should bring it on. Rio thinks if he keeps running like this, it will take time to shake them off, so he sets his head for a moment. He says he'd pass on the baton so they'll meet up again later. Celia asks him what he means, then he tells her that it's part of the plan. She confesses that he has someone helping him, and the person is the girl who first spoke to her telepathically. Then, he flies from a top building. After they land, he calls Aisha, and she appears. Rio gives Celia to Aisha, and Celia asks what is going on. Rio says he'll play decoy and buy some time. Rio tells Celia that both of them will use the opportunity to escape the royal capital together. He promises that he'd meet up with them later, and Aisha says she'll explain about herself to Celia on their way. Aerial knights find Rio at the top of the building, but not with Celia. One of the aerial knights says the alley he comes out of is a dead end so they should inform the teams on the ground. He tells one of them to send up a flare. He points to the sky a signal flare to call for reinforcements, so Rio thinks it's going as planned. All that's left is for Rio to make a big show in drawing them away. The aerial knights unleash an attack on Rio by chanting blitz shot, but none of it hits him. They continue firing. Then he decides to go between buildings where he meets soldiers on horses and those on foot. He fights as much as he can fight, and then he thinks not killing anyone might be making things tougher now. Just in a moment, Sir Alfred comes in and says, he will now restrain Rio. Rio recognizes him as he's the one they call the King's Sword. Sir Alfred orders his men to stand back and begin. The first hit ends in sword on blade tie, and more hits come from Sir Alfred on Rio's knife which pushes him back. Rio can tell that there's some kind of powerful magic formula cast on the sword Sir Alfred is holding. The fight continues as Rio not only uses his knife but also throws a leg hit. Sir Alfred strikes heavily but it can only end on Rio's knife and this time, Sir Alfred is being pushed back. Rio has a chance to turn his blade on Sir Alfred but he decides to push himself back. Sir Alfred asks him why he doesn't use his blade on him, but Sir Alfred sees it as Rio, underestimating him, so he wants to end it. He accumulates more energy in his sword and hits it on the floors, which causes so much destruction to the buildings around them. Sir Alfred's men are looking for Rio after the blast has settled, but he's nowhere to be found, so they report back to Sir Alfred. Sir Alfred says if he takes the full force of the blow, not a trace of him would be left. But he didn't feel it hit him and there's evidence he fled into the back streets. He tells his men to search the surrounding area just to be sure, and they look for Lady Celia as well. Aisha and Celia seem to have escaped from Alfred's men. Celia asks Aisha if Rio is all right, and she says Rio is almost with them. In a short time, Rio meets and she runs to hug Rio, although she almost falls. Rio tells her everything is all right now. Celia sees Rio's clothes, and she asks if he's hurt, but Rio says no. Then, he thanks Aisha. Rio asks Celia if they should go, 
but she asks if it's all right. Then Ryo asks if she still wants to go back and if she can still make it in time. She quickly says no, but she was just thinking it doesn't feel real. Celia says for a moment she thought her life was over, but Ryo saves her and he's with her now, and she thanks him for kidnapping her. Celia says they will have to think of what to do next, and Ryo quickly tells Celia that he has something he must do, but he won't let her suffer for lack of anything when it comes to daily necessities. Celia says she's inexperienced and inept, but she hopes Ryo will look at her kindly. Ryo tells her that he should hope she will look on. She also mentions that they should talk a lot to make up for all the time they didn't see each other. All of a sudden, Aishia says it's coming and there are four firelights of different colors that range from the earth to the cloud. Then it all fades into the cloud after a while. Aishia begs Haruto to help and save them. Some ladies find themselves in a space where they can't reach anyone, as there's no service on their phone, and they get kidnapped by some men. They are kept in a vehicle, but Ryo comes to the scene to rescue them from the men. Then he asks them if there is anyone else, and they point at a building. He unlocks the key to the building and sees Michan, who looks so much like Michan, but the lady thanks him and addresses herself as Ayasimiharu. 